Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Cronin, fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. You're on the Dr. Finance Live podcast. We've got an amazing guest today. We got Paul Nadu, J. Paul Nadu, but Paul is, uh, we, we, he goes by Paul. <laughs> so he's an amazing, amazing speaker, um, a former FBI hostage negotiator. He's a TEDx speaker as well. He spoke on TEDx. What an incredible speech that was. An actor um, and so many other things. So we're going to get to, we're going to get to know a lot about Paul today. Uh, also a good friend on Clubhouse as well. So Paul, welcome to the Dr. Finance Live podcast. How are you, sir? No, oh, I am doing amazing, Dr. Finance. And thank you very much for having me on my show. I'm excited about this. Thank you, Paul. Honor is here as well. So Paul, to get started, I'd like to do a quick, maybe 30 second snapshot of yourself. Um, and then we'll get into your story as well. You got it. Well, <laughs> my beginnings uh, didn't start out all the very best. I was, uh, I was raised in a home with a very violent alcoholic father who used to beat on me, my mother, and my siblings. And I felt very defenseless to protect myself and my mother and uh, the rest of us. So I remember after a beating, when I was about seven years old, I was lying on the ground looking up at my father and thinking to myself, when I grow up, I'm going to be a policeman so I can arrest you and people like you. And I was about seven years old. And... As years went on, uh, my father, who was a very tortured man, ended up killing himself when I was 17. But I had already made up my mind to become a policeman. So I became that policeman at 21. And by then I had learned how to communicate with people and how to go after jobs because I was put out on the streets pretty early to look for work so that I could pay my father for room and board. So I developed these skills of being able to talk with people and influence people in a positive way. And joining the police department, I joined the detective office as well. And once I had joined the detective office, I went into the special victims unit and worked with victims of uh, rape and, and other sexual uh, and abuse matters. And I learned so much from being able to connect with them and help them and catch the bad guys. And, an opportunity came up for me to become a hostage negotiator and I just jumped at it. And I became a hostage negotiator, which was a very rewarding job in that I, I was able to save lives of, of hostages, hostage takers, and even people in crisis. I then had an opportunity to go to the Middle East during the Iraq war as a Canadian peacekeeper. And I, I took that and I went to the Middle East and just outside of Iraq, I was in the Jordanian International Police Training Center. And that was the largest police academy in the world in which we trained Iraqi police cadets to be able to, to police their tortured country. And it was not a very successful mission, but we were doing our very best to teach them. The thing is, we were also teaching, unknownst to us, terrorists who had infiltrated the academy wearing police uniforms. Iraq was in such desperate need of police officers that they were collecting just about anyone. And terrorists got a hold of this information and sent several of them in. It was quite the, quite the story. And actually my life at one point was saved by a terrorist that was about to be killed. My partner and I were about to be killed by 40 terrorists. We were surrounded, we were starting to be beaten to death. And one terrorist stepped in and saved our lives. And it was because of the way that I had treated him in one of my classrooms on an earlier occasion, not knowing that he was a terrorist, but I treated everybody with dignity and respect. And he repaid that with me, with uh, a situation in which he saved my life. And so since then, and uh, I've uh, gone on to retire from the police department, and I'm actually doing some acting, as you said, and I'm doing some writing and I'm doing some keynote speaking. So that's uh, my 30 second, which is more than 30 seconds, <laughs> Dr. Finas, but that's my background to a, a sliver. No, that's perfect. Thank you, Paul. We're, and we're going to get into uh, the specifics of the story in just a moment. Um, and plus, we got uh, basically the way this works is we do a little interview and then I got a, 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 uh, an interrogation of que questions for you afterwards. Sounds We're going to have some fun with it. So, um, so let's start. Let's go back. Um, you're originally from Toronto, Canada? No, I am from about 
a 45 minute drive from Toronto, Canada, a place called Oshawa, Ontario. It was a General Motors town. And I moved to Toronto about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. So you were, you were born about 45 minutes from Toronto. Yeah, that's and then, right. And then you, okay. Um, you, so let's, let's take it back to your childhood. Were you, was it a farm you were raised on or? No, we were raised in the city of Oshawa. My father had moved. He was a lumberjack. And, okay. you know, my father had some great qualities, but he was also, he, he was the victim of violence from a very, very violent father himself. And he was tortured, very, very tortured. And I believe that he was a, a psychopath. Um, that's what I, I draw from my father's behavior. But we lived in a very, very comfortable home. My father was a very intelligent man and he worked not only at a, an automobile uh, company uh, like General Motors, uh, he was able to restore and paint cars and sell them on the side. And he was also a thief, so he made money that way. I was his lookout guy when I was about eight years old and, and stuff like that. But uh, we lived in a very comfortable home. We actually had a cottage and we had a farm, like farmland that we used to visit and just go and, and stay. We had a hundred acres of farmland, not too far from where we resided. It was, my father uh, kept us in a nice home and, and kept us clothed. Yeah. Mm, that's awesome. So what, uh, what was your first 10 years growing up? Like, I mean, can you give us maybe some stories of just to paint the picture of uh, early childhood before we get to you know, teenage years and your, your eventual path to, to where you're at today? Absolutely. I can, Dr. Finance. Thank you for that question. It was tough. My first 10 years were tough. Of course, when children are abused and this is all they know, they believe that the world is that way. And it really is about self-preservation. And we were always walking on eggshells because we did not know what would spark my father into a fit of anger and then a beating for us. And the beatings were quite severe. So my world was very cautious. However, my mother, my dear angel mother, who was the victim of domestic abuse herself and had to work very, very hard, wasn't given any type of, of allowance to, to do things on her own, but she was incredibly intelligent when it came to business. And what she used to do is she used to buy encyclopedias. Back then we had things called encyclopedias, not computers. <laughs> and the encyclopedias had all kinds of information about everything. If you wanted to know something about flowers, you'd go to the encyclopedia and you'd read the encyclopedia. She used to buy these things and then she would sell them for a profit, you know, and she knew how to do it. She knew how to say, well, you know, I'm struggling and I'm this and I'm that. But there was also a radio program in our area in which callers could call in and take about a minute or two to say, hey, I want to sell my encyclopedias. And I'm asking, you know, $75 for them and they're worth 150 and all that kind of th stuff. But she was so busy taking care of the home. And we also had uh, boarders who lived in the basement. So she had to take care of their places, cleaning it up, that she gave that responsibility of calling the radio station to me. And so here I am, an eight-year-old boy, calling up a radio station and talking to somebody like yourself, Dr. <laughs> Finance, and saying, hi, my mother has these encyclopedias. And then I developed this. They, they welcomed me every time I came on the show. Hey, it's Paul. Paul, what are you selling today? And I would go into that. But one of the, one of the things that I remember uh, significantly, Dr. Finance, was the day that my father killed Santa Claus. I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And what had happened was about, I was about seven or eight years old at the time, still believed in Santa Claus. It was two weeks before Christmas. My brother and I were standing on the landing in our home and we live in Canada, very cold, lots of snow. And the door opens, we were excited. Christmas is coming, Santa Claus is coming. And the door opened and in walked my father holding a 22 rifle. And he looked at my brother and I square in the eyes and he said, I just killed Santa Claus. There's not going to be a Christmas this year. And he walked downstairs and he put his rifle away. And my brother and I fell apart, as you can well imagine. And that was the day that Santa Claus died and I never believed in him again. 
But these things, all these things that happened to me, they also happened in a way for me. You know, they were tragic, they were terrible, but they built a skin around me that I eventually ended up using to help others get through traumas like the ones I just described to you. So the first 10 years of my life were hard. Uh, they were, yeah, they were just hard. And I, I didn't have that confidence because I was an abused kid who would go to school and get bullied. And so I, re I don't remember too many happy times in those first 10 years. The, 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 when he did the, just going back to that story, when he killed, said he killed Santa Claus, was he just trying to intimidate you guys? Oh, he was serious. He was serious. Oh, yeah. there, there are other things I could tell you that I don't think that your audience would want to hear uh, because they're, they're pretty traumatic. And uh, he, he took me, okay, you asked for it, Dr. Finance, what, so here it comes. What, yeah, totally up to you, Paul. You don't have to, you know. No, no, it's in my book. I've, I've talked about this. Um, yeah, this is a situation where he used to lock me in the trunk of a car. Uh, for hours on end, and he would drive to different places. And I, I know what he was doing. I, I believe I, I know what he was doing. And part of it was that he was engaging in illegal activities and other things. And so I would be locked in this trunk for long periods of time. And one day, it was a summer day, I remember that we were, I was in the trunk, and I could hear you know, the stones, of course, hitting the undercarriage of the car. And I knew that we were on a gravel road. And then suddenly we were, you know, I, I believed we were on grass because I could hear the grass hitting the sides of the car. And the car come to a stop. And he got out and he opened the trunk and he got me to, to, to get out. Again, I'm about, all this happened, you know, like seven, eight, nine years old. And when I got out be, beside him, he started to walk towards this old farmhouse. And when you looked at it, it looked almost like the psycho house that we saw in the movie, the 1960s <laughs> movie, Psycho. It was terrifying. And I could hear this bird squawking and it terrified me too. It was a cage on a, on a tree. But what terrified me the most, Dr. Finance, is that I could hear babies crying. And not one, not two, not three, but several babies crying. And as I walked towards him, I was holding his pant leg and he was pushing me along and we walked behind the house. And when we walked behind the house, there was this big cement garage, like an industrial size garage. And the babies were crying from inside that garage and I, I was terrified. And he kept moving closer and closer with me by his side. When we got to the door, the sound of the babies crying was so intense. I took, you know, a breath and, and I believe I had tears in my eyes, but he opened the door and he pushed me in. And what I saw were pigs hanging from hooks from the ceiling, being slaughtered, being gutted in front of me. And I remember one, the moment I walked in being, well, I won't go into graphics, but the blood that resulted from that action splashed on my pants and I just these are the things that my father would take me through there are more but I won't get into them because they're, they're even more horrific wow oh geez <laughs> that is crazy <laughs> well, well you, you know it's crazy Dr. Finance but it's not exclusive to me regrettably yeah there's, there's so many people across the world who are being tormented and tortured like this as children and it's sad yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Paul. Um, so, so, Paul, moving forward, the reason I wanted to step back for a second, Paul, just to let you know, sorry to go that route, but I want to... Not wanted, at all. Not at we're all. Gonna, we're going to explain, you know, your success stories, and I always like to take a step back and demonstrate to people that it's not all what you see. To get to that steel, you, you have to first start with the refinement process, and it starts at the foundation. And so... A lot of tragedies, a lot of things that happen early on in life have actually, as you said, they don't happen uh, to you. They're happening for you, right? So they're building these, these individuals, these great people, like all the people we've had on this show so far, these Hall of Fame speakers, the, the billionaires, the et cetera. They've all had started with some kind of molding at childhood. So 
to get to that success, to, to that success um, story, I, I'm glad that we stepped back for a moment and, and highlighted the, your foundation, which made you a great speaker. So um, moving on to the next part of the journey, your next 10 years, um, did, you, did you do a lot of entrepreneur jobs? Um, what, what, was your, what was your early uh, teens, et cetera? What do they, they look like? I love how you're transitioning into the next 10 years because there's a lot of changes that happened in the next 10 years. Uh, as tormented as my father was, there came a point where my mother had had enough and she, she found within herself. And she was a French speaking woman. We were living in a French community and it was very difficult because she had broken English, but she decided to leave my father and go out on her own with us kids and try to make a living for herself, which she learned how to speak English and worked in restaurants. And so we were it was about 14 or 15 when that happened. And by then I had developed the skill or a skill uh, to communicate with adults, with people much older than myself, because my father had sent me out to find jobs when I was 12, so I could pay him room and board. And back then, I could lie about my age, and they would say, okay, well, you'll be a busboy, you'll be this, you'll be that. So I knew really the, the importance of being able to, to pitch yourself in a way that you know that you connect with someone and that you'll do the work that you promise that you'll do. And so by the time I turned 16, I had this confidence in me. All my buddies in school were saying, we can't find a job. We can't find a job. I would go out and I'd find four. When I was 17, I was delivering drugs for a clinic. I had long hair down to my shoulders and I, I drove a car. I got a car when I was 16 years old, had money in the bank. And I, I just had this wonderful confidence about myself. And they were complaining about having no jobs. I would go out and find four and say, okay, well, I'm taking these two because they work out for me. So those 10 years, uh, the first few were not the easiest. But once my mother had finally left my dad, uh, it, things started to kind of fall into place for me uh, because I was no longer in that environment of fear. And I knew how to get work and I knew how to develop myself and learn. And I really was intense on becoming that policeman that I had promised myself. And when I, as I said, at the age of 17, my father actually killed himself with the same rifle he killed Santa Claus with. And the first time that he had tried it, I found him. Uh, my mother had separated from him. She had this premonition, this, this idea, this whisper that my father had done something terrible. And when we got there, I had to kick through the door and found him on the ground with a rifle beside him and a bottle of whatever it was. And he just didn't, he had, the, the gun had jammed is what had happened. But a few months later, he succeeded and nobody was around to, to help him. Following that, I was taking care a little bit of my mom and my younger siblings. And then I just got into uh, being able to develop myself. And uh, I ended up becoming one of the youngest store detectives uh, we had this great big department store and I walked in with the idea that if you don't ask, you don't get. And at the time, they weren't choosing 18 or 19 year old kids really to be the store detectives to catch shoplifters. But I had the brilliant idea one day because I was unheard of. I had the brilliant idea, Dr. Finance. I thought to myself, well, I want to become a policeman. So I want to do something in line with the work that I'll be doing. So why don't I ask to become a store detective? Why not? I knew nobody my age who ever had that. And I remember walking into this huge department store and it was a department chain. And I asked to speak to the security manager. And of course, long hair and I'm dressed like a kid with a psychedelic shirts, whatever it was. <laughs> and, and the women looking at me, I think it was at the makeup counter and they went, can we ask you what this is about? And I said, well, I'd rather talk to the security manager if I may. And uh, they ended up calling him about 10 minutes later, this stashing man with a nice uh, beard, he shows up and he's kind of inquisitive and he's like, can I help you? And I said, are you the security manager? He said, well, yes, I am. I said, may I have 10 minutes of your time? And he said, yeah, follow me to my office. <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Finance, he was curious as heck as to what this kid was gonna do. 
So as soon as I sat down in his chair across from him, I launched into my pitch. I know I'm only 18 years old. I know I got long hair, but I can work for you and I can do a good job. Who would ever suspect me of catching shoplifters? I can do that. Nobody would ever. And he and I had the greatest conversation for about 40 minutes. I think he laughed. <laughs> and then he got out of his chair and he, he, he went and he, he met somebody at the door. And I was introduced to this older man with white hair. And it turned out to be the general manager of the store. And this, this store manager, his name is Chet. Chet Jackson, I'll remember him forever. He sat down across from me and he's, he was the man I was pitching to. And he says, you know, Paul, he says, we don't hire people your age to do this kind of work. Our security advisors and, and guards and, and undercover people are much older than you. But we're making an exception today. <laughs> You're hired. You start in two weeks. D I, Dr. Finance, I made more money uh, in one hour than most full-time employees doing that work that were there for years. And it really taught me the importance of going for what you want and for taking those risks, even though the odds seem ridiculous and people may say to you, well, you know, you'll never get that. Well, give me a shot. The worst they can say is no. And as Wayne Gretzky, the Canadian hockey player always says, he says, you always miss. 100% of the shots that you don't take. And I use this example in my book and I say, here's this 18 year old long haired kid. And at the time, this was back in the, in the uh, this was back in the early seventies. And we didn't have security guards my age, like undercover security guards, 18 years old, are you kidding? At least I didn't know of any, but I took that risk. At the risk of being told, no, it's okay. I would have gone to the other department store, which was next on my list. But I did that. So those 10 years were very eye-opening for me. And I ended up going to a community college. And then that brought me into my 20s. Did, did you have a lot of entrepreneurial jobs uh, besides the one you mentioned? or Not really. I, at the time, I wasn't really thinking entrepreneur. My, my focus was really on becoming that that gatekeeper, the police right. officer, the one who served and protected. And even though I would get the jobs that I wanted, I wouldn't go into the entrepreneurial side of things. You did a lot of jobs though. Like you probably, I imagine paper boy, all that stuff. Did you do any of that? Oh, I did the paper boy stuff when I was <laughs> a boy, of course, you know, and, and my brother and sister used to rip me off for the money that I made. <laughs> That's another story. But yeah, I did that. Um, I ended up working in restaurants. I ended up having some incredible jobs and just meeting some incredible people. And I, like, like I, I mentioned earlier, I wasn't afraid of going and asking for, I wanted, for what I wanted back then because I developed these skills of being confident and being assured mm -hmm. and just saying, you know, this is a job like the one that I just described to you, the undercover detective at the age of 18, is that why not ask for that and why not go for that? And it has served me because it's now a story that I can tell that really highlights the importance of having vision, of taking risks, and of going, even though people may say to you, that's a ridiculous thought. You'll never start that business. You'll never start this. You'll never start that. Who are you to even try that? And you have to look at the naysayers and say, I know me. I know myself and it's okay if I'm rejected or if I fail because I'll just try again and it's not failure then. And so you just, you believe in yourself, put aside the naysayers and you throw yourself into whatever it is that you dream of. And if you want it bad enough, we all know, we've heard this before. Do you want it or do you want it bad enough? And if I want it bad enough, you ain't gonna stop me. Nobody's gonna stop me. It's like the Rocky you know, the Rocky shows that we've all seen, you get I'm from down Philly. Like that. What's that? <laughs> I'm from Philadelphia. Oh no, gosh. Not. All right. Is, <laughs> is the statue still in Philadelphia? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh God. I got to see that. <laughs> anyway, That's, I was talking yeah. about Stallone the other day. I said, somebody said, so Stallone, uh, the man Stallone, somehow that, that got into the conversation. Like in Philly, Stallone's not a man. He's a God. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like his what he created with Rocky really describes the essence of the fighting spirit 
of not just this city, but I think of humanity. It's the metaphor is so much, so much bigger than that. But you know, Doctor Finance, I just want to say something about that, if I may. Yeah. And it, you're, you're so right about that. In his his life, it was not always easy, as we know. And but he had a vision and a dream. And to all your subscribers and listeners, it's so important to have that vision and dream. And also to know your value, because when they offered him, I think it was $250,000, he just sold his, his dog, and they didn't want to make him part of the script, but they wanted to buy the script and take complete control of it. And he just said no. He believed in what he had so much that he stuck to it, and he just moved forward, and he never gave up. And I think that that's one of the keys to any successful business, as you know, is to believe in yourself, to believe in your value and to just set aside the naysayers and say, I know what I have and what I can offer you and just move ahead with it. You know, you're going to yeah, get knocked to the ground, but you're <laughs> going to get back up. So spot on, Paul. I'm sure you're, you're very familiar with his, uh, his quote. I think it was from Rocky Five. I, I put it in my last book. It was such a great quote. It was a life quote when he was basically talking to his, um, he was talking to his son outside of his restaurant and he was giving him, lessons on life <laughs> oh i know I, life ain't all rainbows and yeah sunshine. it can be a mean and nasty place and it will beat you down to your knees if you let it but it's not about having it beat you down to your knees it's about getting back up and going forward or something like that yeah and that's it, it it's beautiful it's beautiful <laughs> now if you know what you're worth go out and get what you're worth but don't be pointing the finger at him or her saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her, because that's what losers do. And you're not a loser. So I love that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did I say Paul was an actor? We're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. All right. Thanks, Paul. So, Paul, you wind up graduating college before you went into the police department. Is that right? Yes. And yes. Then you want to tell us what happened at that point? So what age were you went into the, when you became a policeman? 21. I was 21 uh -huh. years old, and I, I applied the moment I turned 21. And by then, I like I'm not the smartest guy, Doctor Finance. It, it takes me long to me a long time to memorize certain things. But what I have is I I'm persistent, and I know what I want. So I would spend in in college hours and hours and hours of studying the material, because going back into my younger years. There, there's an important story I believe I can, I can insert in here, one I should have inserted earlier. I did not have that confidence and I couldn't retain anything. I remember my mother spending the time that she could with me trying to drill the information into me in grade school. You're gonna have to study for this test and I would cry, I can't, I can't, I don't know anything. And I was always the one with the lowest grade in class. And this was in grade six, five, six, and I would imagine that I only went from one grade to another because the teachers didn't want to keep me in their class. I was rebellious. I was angry. I disrupted the, the classroom because that's the only place I could act out. And so I did. And I remember, again, the number seven plays a huge role in my life. And it just keeps coming up. In grade seven, I remember just not being able to retain anything. I was, I was being bullied and, and everybody laughed at me, that kind of stuff. And I remember this one teacher and he looked at me, really like, actually, he looked at the class and he said, we have a test uh, on Monday and I suspect that everybody here is going to pass. Except for you, Nido. I already know you're going to fail. Wow. Yeah. And Dr. Finance, I was so humiliated. In grade seven, I started to like girls. I started to really think about who I was. I didn't have the confidence, but he humiliated me in front of all these students who turned around and started laughing. And I felt like going into a small shell and crying myself you just you, to wherever. And I remember going back home that weekend and just crying and locking myself in my room. And I took out the books and I didn't have the skills to study, but I went through that material over and over and over and over again. And when I wrote that test on that Monday, 
I, we have two voices in our heads, as you know, and the one says, hey, you're going to fail. You're just going to fail, Paul. Like, what are you even writing this test for? And the other one says, you know what? You studied this stuff. I think you know some of it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. And I wrote the test. We handed it in. And as was customary in this one teacher's classroom, is that he would read uh, the the lowest graded test first. And he would call the student to the front of the classroom. And guess who that always was? I was conditioned. I would get 40% or 48%. And I was the first one to be called. And on this day, he started calling out the lowest grade. It wasn't me. The second one wasn't me. The third one wasn't me. The fourth one wasn't me. By the middle of the class, the students were looking at back at me going, what's going on? Why aren't you up there? And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. But I've got these two little voices. One says, you passed that. You did good. And the other one's saying, oh, he's going to humiliate you like you've <laughs> never been humiliated before. The setup. <laughs> the setup. Yeah, I love it. I, I hadn't thought of that. that. I'm going to use that in my stories. Setup. <laughs> it was a setup. And, I, and that's the voice that was shouting at me. It's a setup. And it came down to the last three students. And I remember uh, my, my cousin, her name was Lise, and she was one of, one of the Browners. Uh, we called them Browners. They were, they were the ones who had the highest uh, grade. And the other one was a girl by the name of Giselle. And the two of them used to compete for the highest grade. And wow. I was in that number. Again, thinking to myself, probably a setup. Just wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> he called my cousin Lise next. Then he called me. I had the second highest grade that day. And for me, Dr. Finance, that was a defining moment in my life where I remember collecting, walking. I didn't take the walk of shame. I went up and I took my paper and I felt so proud of myself and something happened in me. I actually started to believe that I could do whatever it was that I set to do. That was my defining moment. So I'm going to fast forward to the college years in which I devoted my time to getting a 4.0 average and to graduating with high honors. And then here's a kid who never knew how to study before, but who just did what it needed to, what needed to be done to get it done. And I proudly accepted my, you know, graduating with high honors. And, and of course, the police department, oh, you graduated with high, uh, high honors. And yes, I did. And so I joined the police department at 21. And it was a great experience. Problem was, I was put on a platoon of uniform officers who really hated being uniform officers. They were senior officers and they just hated their job. And so eight hours a shift, I would listen to the gripes that they had, how the police department had let them down, how the public was, was no good, how you know, they hated their lives. And when you're surrounded by this negativity all the time, you start to doubt where, what you're doing there, and you start to get saturated with this negativity yourself. So I finally said in, in the first couple of years of my job, I went to my staff sergeant, and I said, listen, if you keep me with these officers, if you keep me in a car, a two-man car, sitting with these guys night after night after night, I'm likely going to quit because I'm not loving the job that I joined to do. Leave me alone and I will produce for you. Just let me, give me a car, a single man unit, and I will produce for you. And the staff sergeant looked at me and he said, all right, you got it, prove yourself. And I went out there and I arrested drunk drivers. I arrested robbery suspects. I used to go to the warrant box. We had a warrant box. I'd look for people who had warrants and, and some really hardened criminals and I'd hunt them down like a, like a dog. Yeah, and I arrested them. And I, I built that reputation enough that when I asked to become a detective, my staff sergeant jumped up and said, you got it, the inspectors got you, and thank you very much. And I got put into the detective office. Wow. Um, I, I want to I come right back to that exact point, but I just want to jump back to part of your story. Shame on that educator, that teacher of yours in seventh grade for doing that, because they don't really, in my opinion, when people do stuff like that, they don't really get the essence of what they're there to do uplift their students and bring them up and when you put them down like that and you notice as a negotiator all you did was um, either one of two things you either added fuel to them if they're smart enough to, to click and use that as fuel or you actually just drove them into the into the cemetery for the rest of their life and and, and stamped on them 
your opinion, which would basically dictate the rest of their life because they're walking around the rest of their life with the thought in their head that they're not worth anything because my teacher said so. So, you know, that, that's just, I, when I hear stories like that, that's just, just sad as me because those people don't belong to be teachers. They don't deserve that, that reputation, the, the honor that should be associated with a, a, a true educator. So I just wanted to add on that. Yeah, I love what you just said. And this I'm is I'm a professor way- for 10 years, by the way. So I, I, you know, I'm speaking from an educational standpoint. And you're absolutely right. I, I want to throw in just a different perspective on that because what you just described is how I felt for years and years and years. And I thought, you idiot, and how could you do that? Back in the uh, the 60s and the 70s, the early 70s, the teachers were allowed to spank you. They were allowed to you know, give you the ruler and stuff like that. And that's the way it was in our Catholic school. And this, this man, I won't name him, uh, but uh, I believe after all these years, I sat telling this story to somebody and, and the person looked at me and said, huh, have you ever thought that he did that for you? I said, what do you mean? Did you ever think it might have been tough love that he had tried everything else? And he just wanted to see how you would respond to that. And that kind of opened up a new thing to me is that I remember this man, this teacher, you know, like throwing me across the floor, doing all these kinds of things and saying, when are you going to wake up or you know, stuff like that. And then that day, I looked at that day very differently. On the one hand, it's exactly as you described. On the other hand, I'm wondering if in his own mind, he thought, I wonder if this is going to work. He's at an age where it might work. If I use tough love on him, will it work? And if that was his thought and his train of mind, it paid off huge because I have so much to be grateful for to him because that was my pivot moment. And a lot of people say, well, when, when was your pivot moment? Mine was in grade seven, being humiliated by a teacher who may have had my best interests in mind. I just don't know. But that's just a different perspective to it. But what you said is exactly how I believed for many, many years, is how dare you do that to a student? Because you could destroy them. And that could have gone either way. It's like, okay, there's a 50, 50% chance yeah. that this works. That, that's my point, Paul. Like, you know, you, you were the success story of his doings. And we don't know what was in his mind. I mean, when people do stuff like that, who knows? I mean, they might have really meant well, and you're right. They might have walked through all the steps and they were just, they ran out of options. They're like, look, anything's good at this point. I've tried everything that I can possibly do. Let's try something really weird. And that might've worked. But if that was his intention, now we don't know that, but what we do know is that he did that to you. And if he did that to other people too, which it sounds like he was, because you said he was calling out all the, the lowest scores and highlighting them. And, and showcase them, which is a bad tactic to do, you know, as a negotiator, you want to oh, yeah. try to find the, the, the good in people, not the bad, right? Then how many people that are not standing here in this podcast today that were the opposite success story that we don't know about that have, have buried themselves in a life of mediocrity or less because of what he might have done to them? That is so true. You nailed it right on the head. It's, it's a, a tactic that, I, that we both know uh, <laughs> not to use. But in this particular case, I'm standing here because it did. You know? uh, this is great. We used it. This was a good little case study on, on the topic as well. So thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And picking up where the story uh, left off. So you, went, you were you becoming a detective. How, how old were you when, when you actually made detective status? I made uh, detective status. <laughs> 27. There's that number again, 27. Uh, I made the detective. And at the time, in our police uh, service, it was really unheard of to reach the rank of detective in in such a short order. It usually took about 10 to 15 years before you would get to that point. But my work ethic was so strong, and I, I just wanted to do as much as I possibly could. And I got recognized for the good work that I was doing and for the uh, I got recognized by the officers who didn't want to be awakened at two or three o'clock in the morning by me shouting on the radio, hey, I got one, you know, they, <laughs> not quite in those words, but they were trying to get their beauty sleep or whatever when they parked their cars. Uh, but I was out catching criminals and doing my job and, and just feeling good about it. So yeah, 27, I, I joined the the detective office. And at the time, I was 
I was given a, an assignment in what we called the youth division, the youth crime. And I dealt with criminals under, well, criminals, young people under the age of uh, 18. So any crimes committed by young people, they would go to the youth division and they would be handled, of course, differently than adults. When you turned 18, you were an adult, you went to adult court under 18, you were in the juvenile system. And uh, there were some horrific crimes being committed by young people, as you know. But I realized that I had the ability to interrogate. When I say interrogate, everybody hates the word interrogation. Mm -hmm. But uh, because we, we imagine these lights and, and uh, <laughs> cops going, come on, you did it. We know you did it. Well, that's not an interrogation. Interrogation to me is just a, it's really exploratory. It's trying to find out and determine the truth. And I was very good at doing that. And what I would say to people who were suspected of crimes coming in was, I would pretty much lay it out this way. My name is Paul and you've been accused of doing something. And I have no idea if this is what you did. I'm here to treat you with dignity and respect and I would, tr I would trust that you'll do the same for me. I'm not here to judge you and I'm not here to find you guilty of anything. I'm only here to find out your side of the story, what happened. And so let's start with that. And using this, and we know that even when we go into a negotiation, we have an opening, an opening paragraph that we use. Mine was, came about from a lot of experience and it worked for me. And it demonstrated that I was genuinely interested in finding out who that person was across from me because I wasn't walking in and I made this decision very early on in my career, my detective career. I wasn't walking in to talk to a criminal, to talk to a murderer. I was walking in to talk to a human being mm. who may have committed the crime, but I first wanted to find out who the human being was. So often we just have to separate the action from the individual. Mm. And that applies to our private lives as well. Is it when somebody has wronged us or whatever, and we're going to talk to them because they wronged us, we first have to remove what it is that they've wronged us or that we feel that they've wronged us for and talk to the human being. And then when we make that connection, then bring back, hey, I want to talk about this now. And it's building that rapport and that connection that matters so much. Mm. That's, that's beautiful, Paul. And, and Paul, we're going we're gonna to get into um, some specific aspects of negotiating a little bit. That's part of the, the, the questions I have for you, because I think that would be a really cool add on to to uh, the discussion, not just from like what you do perspective, but tying it into a lot of the entrepreneurs that might be listening to this from a business perspective, negotiating is really important as well. Having these same skills are transportable. So, um, so Paul, getting back to your story, you were detective at 27. How long did you do detective work for? And then what was the next steps after that? Uh, I did detective work pretty much until the end of my career. I was on the job for 31 and a half years and uh, it was either a detective or a sergeant. I did a, a small stint as a, as a patrol sergeant, which I didn't like. And that's a story onto its own. There was this uh, idiot inspector that wanted me to break the law uh, just to get an arrest. And I told him I wouldn't do it. And uh, he took a disliking to me and put a target on my back. And I thought, nope, I'm going to leave this area of detective work, which I love so much because he's going to find something or he's going to create something. He was just that kind of man. So I left for about uh, four years and then got back into the major crimes division. That's when I joined the, uh, the SVU uh, office and started working as an SVU detective. And I stayed there. Uh, until I got burnt out. Day after day, when you're dealing with the special victims unit, uh, special victims and people who have gone through horrific things, uh, sexual assaults and child abuse, I, I was very compassionate and very uh, open and I was able to reach them, but it had been taken a toll on me and I, I, I kept my professionalism and kept that and that's why I got so much success. I had people who would otherwise never open up to anybody to tell their most deepest and darkest. Can you imagine being the victim? You're, you're 12 years old or 14 years old or 90 years old. I, I dealt with victims who were 90 years old, who had been 
and I won't go into graphic detail, but they had been uh, assaulted in a terrible way. Now you're in front of a man and the man is asking, hey, tell me the, you know, the deepest and darkest. We want to catch this guy. Well, that doesn't work unless you know how to connect with people and you genuinely are interested in their welfare and their well-being. And I knew how to do that. What happened was I didn't think that I was being burnt out. But Dr. Finance, I had walked into this one room and I was talking to a young girl, probably about 14 years old, and she was just broken and she was crying so much. And what had happened to her was that she was in class and somebody had touched her leg inappropriately. And this just broke her down. And I remember when she was talking to me and crying, something happened to me. In the back of my mind, I thought, why is she crying so much? The young girl I had in here just yesterday who was violated so much wasn't doing that. She wasn't crying at all. And it hit me. Oh my God, you've just started comparing stories. You don't know the backstory to what this young girl, what triggered this emotion in her. And now you're comparing stories. And I was five or six years into the special victims unit and I was their top officer. And I remember walking into my detective sergeant's office and sitting down that day and saying, I want out. I can't do this anymore. Uh, I'm starting to compare stories and I will not stay. And so I left there and I was transferred into our learning center to teach. And I know that you're a, a teacher as well. And I started to teach police officers on interviewing and interrogation. And uh, I, I stayed there for a couple of years. And then that's when the opportunity to become a peacekeeper came up. And I, I took the peacekeeper's job. When I came back uh, from the peacekeeper's job, my, my inspector, who was a great man, a really nice man, kept in touch with me in the Middle East. Uh, he says, well, he says, regrettably, you can't go back to the learning center because you're only allowed three years there. And they're counting this year of you being in the Middle East as one of those years. So where would you like to work? And I said, oh, I don't know. And so at the time, there was a, a job to work with the media, which really interested me. And there was another job to be in human resources, hiring police officers. I wasn't so interested in that. But then there was the polygraph. Uh, interviewing and interrogating criminals and, and using the skills that I had, that interested me. So I told my inspector, of the three that you've offered me, which were great jobs, they were like, they were the golden jobs. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd like to become a polygraph. If I'm going to choose one of the three, okay, what's your second one? Media relations. I'll do media relations as second. I'll do the human resources as third. And he reaches me about three or four weeks later, says, congratulations, you're our new polygraph examiner. I thought, great. <laughs> and so when I touched back down in Canada, I remember that I had been away from my family for a year. Like I'd seen them once in that, in that period. And it was really tough. And now I had to make another move to go to the Canadian Police College in Ottawa, Ontario for a three month extensive course on not only how to use the polygraph instrument, but how to build on the interrogation and interviewing skills that I already had. Very, very intense because they don't select anyone as a polygraph examiner. You have to know what you're doing. And so I went for three months, came back, and that's how I ended up my career as a polygraph examiner. What, at what point did you become an FBI negotiator? Well, you know, everybody says FBI. I was not. <laughs> Oh, was, okay. Yeah. The, the negotiator, the hostage negotiator was in Canada. And I did uh, some, one actual negotiation in the Middle East with a terrorist. Okay. But that was just because I happened to be there at the time. But no, a lot of people say FBI negotiator, but I'm a Canadian hostage negotiator. Oh, okay. And, and, that, and that began um, over it, it, the When I was working in the sexual assault unit, uh, the SVU unit, as it's referred to in some places, uh, there came a, uh, that was probably, I'm thinking six years into my detective work. And I happened to be at my desk one day when an opportunity arose on the computer saying, we're looking for a hostage negotiator who's interested in it. And I said, wow, that's a, that's a pretty sexy job, you know, like a, 
I got the skills. And so I went to my, <laughs> to my sergeant and uh, he said, oh, yes, 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 yes. And my inspector said, of course, we're putting your name for it. And I got it. Yeah. Oh, wow. How, how long did you do that for? I did that for 10, well, about, well, almost 10 years. But during that course of time, I went to the, deployed to the Middle East. So I ended up doing that for about 10 years. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And you know, I, I didn't put two and two together. I was, uh, yeah, when you think hostage negotiator, I think most people connect that with FBI for some reason, but you're, you're in Canada, so that wouldn't make any sense. So I apologize for that. No, I don't, don't. don't. I, I, I've got, grown so accustomed to, oh, Paul's a FBI. I, I used to correct. Uh, and so now it's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Paul. That's where, yeah, it's really weird. All these, all, all these months I've been thinking FBI has to go here, but, uh, yeah, yeah. but that's an incredible story. And I just want to want to go back to one point that you made, which is very, something I, you know, I, I think a lot of people think about you're negotiating in depth with people every day, trying to help people out and um, you, to, to get to the, to the solution to figure out why somebody beat up a 90 year old person you got to connect to that nine-year-old person, right? To, you have to connect to that 14-year-old girl, right? Like to do that, you have to put yourself in a position where you're heart to heart, you're connecting, like you're, you're actually getting to know them, feeling for them, empathizing for them, right? Day by day, as you said, when you were comparing two people, you got to that point where you were comparing others to, to different situations. You're you're not really focused on that individual. You're, you're kind of putting them in a statistic standpoint. What, like, what do you think is the, what do you think is the effect on, not just yourself, but you've been in that position. What do you think is the effect on a lot of people who hold similar jobs to yourself that are like in CSI or, you know, those really big uh, units that, that are out there trying to help people every day. Don't you think after a while it has a, there's a mental effect on those people, I mean, even if they got the biggest heart, especially if they got the biggest heart, it just becomes a burden on them and they, they, they might snap at some point, right? I mean, this, we see this in, with soldiers, especially really nice people go over to war and they come back and they're just torn. They seen too much, you know, do, do, you, do you think that seeing too much and has an effect on uh, the, 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 um, the person's mentality? And then maybe that might be a loaded question. I'm not sure if I presented that. No, it, you know, Dr. Finance, I have to first say what a wonderful question to ask because it does affect so many people. The answer to what you said very shortly is yes, because we do, uh, the soldiers, our soldiers, our first responders, people who see not the best things in life, who are yeah. not in a bubble that are going to deal with people who are in stress and torment and trauma, whatever it is, a lot of that does affect the responder and the person whose job it is to make things better or to try to make things better. It's very, very important that we keep checking in with ourselves. And, and I believe that back when I did this, it wasn't cool to go to someone and talk about what was going on in your head or to deal with something. I remember at the time I was married and uh, my wife at the time, when I, we first got married, one of the first things that she said to me is I never wanna hear about your job. I never wanna hear about what you go through. Never wanna talk about your work. And you need someone to talk about the things that are happening. So when I would listen to her talk about her job and how her boss was annoying and did this and did that, and meanwhile, I'm thinking to myself, well, I just held a dead baby today, or I just dealt with someone who almost killed themselves and I couldn't talk about it. The important thing is that we keep in check with ourselves and that we do talk to people uh, to, to get it off our chest and just to remind ourselves of the worthy work that we're doing, because it is. We need someone to do these jobs and we need someone proficient. When I got burnt out, I could have continued to do that job and I could have continued to do it very, very well, but I chose not to because I didn't want to go back in my mind saying, I'm comparing that that wasn't so bad. I needed that extra, which I learned since then, is never, if someone responds in one way, 
it's only the tip of the iceberg. That young girl who cried because she was touched on her leg, she may have been the victim of abuse in her own home, sexual abuse in her home. She might have been an uncle, a father, could have been brother. We, had, we don't know what's happened to this young girl, but she reached that limit where someone touched her and it just brought all these, these sad emotions out of her. And we cannot judge without knowing all the facts. I've learned that. The, life is a, is a teaching opportunity. And when we learn from these experiences and not just dismiss them, when we say, okay, there's more behind the surface here, then we, we, we graduate to another level. We transform to another level. We get more information. Going back to what your question was, there is a danger for first line responders uh, to, to be so affected by it that they'll turn to alcohol, they'll turn to drugs, they'll turn to you know, perhaps even thoughts of suicide, which we've seen in professions like this, when people have such stress and trauma thrown at them day after day after day. And it's not uncommon to read about a detective or a soldier or someone else taking their own lives. And the important message that I would send to any responder who is feeling overwhelmed right now is to talk to somebody and to reach out to somebody. It's okay to unload to someone who can help and someone who's willing to listen and be productive uh, in helping you to get where you want to be. And that applies to business people too. There are some business professionals, there are some CEOs there, and it's not unlike the stresses that we feel as first responders. The CEOs have to make sure that the company is moving correctly, right. that all their employees are taken care of correctly, and that their customers and clients are taken. And there's so much responsibility in the shoulders of young CEOs, older CEOs, and sometimes they don't have anybody to talk to. So those stresses can cause a lot of mental um, wellness problems because they're doubting themselves and they're, they're overstressed and they're overworked. And it's really important that we recognize when that's happening, that we have become aware of how we're feeling and why we're feeling, and that we reach out and just share these thoughts with people so that we can continue being the professionals in the positions that we've chosen to be in and that we can continue doing our work. So it applies to CEOs as well. So do you think the solution for a lot of these extreme cases, whether it's business or military or police or whatever the case may be in life, uh, I mean, this goes back to deep psychology, so Sigma Freud 101. Do you think it's really about just the solution is just talking to someone and letting it out and mentally and, and your mind will organize itself in the process? Just by no, talking? Not, not entirely, Dr. Finance. I, I believe that a lot of things come into play. And I talk about this in, uh, in my rooms, about uh, how to negotiate our way out of self-sabotage. Th there's so much importance to starting our day off with intention. And what I mean by that is that if we got into a routine, if each and every one of us got into a routine, starting our day off with gratitude, just a few moments of gratitude, I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the fact that I have a home to live in. I have food to, uh, to uh, survive on. I have a job, I have people who love me, I love people, I'm grateful for this. And then we start to choose the attitude we're going to have for that day. For example, there's two closets in our mind, I believe this. On the one side, we have this closet that's filled with stress, regret, shame, the things that we don't want to go to. That's in our minds. We can access that, but we shouldn't. We should keep that door locked. On the other side of our mind would be this closet <laughs> filled with hope and, and faith and uh, determination and all this stuff. So we go in and before we clothe our outer bodies, we choose the attitude that we want for the day. Today, I'm going to wear uh, servitude. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. And then we start to use mantras, like mantras, Paul, you're fantastic. You're not gonna let anybody get to you. You consciously do that. You consciously say to yourself, even in the third person, you're amazing. You're fantastic. You're going to do it today. Nothing's going to bother you. You're going to serve your, your customers, your client, everybody. If somebody cuts you off, not going to phase you. So we actually go through a four or five minute ritual morning 
morning exercise in which we get ourselves mentally prepared for the day. And we may even write this down in a journal. We may even make this promise to ourselves. Meditation is so important. It's not only about talking to somebody, it's about talking to you and how you talk to yourself and what it is that you bring into your space, your headspace. It is believing that the day is going to be the very, very best. And if I'm going into that special victims unit office, I'm going to tell myself in my morning exercise, I'm going to say, you know, you're going to be dealing with some stuff, but you got it. You got it. Remember, you're there to serve. You're there to help. You got this. Paul, you got this. And then even when we are walking into a situation, Dr. Finance, how many of us look at something, hey, I'm walking into a boardroom, I've got this negotiation to go on with, and we start to doubt these things because we got all this, the, the, the stuff going on in our heads. We got to stop and we got to say, I got to get rid of that stuff. And I've got to know, number one, that I'm prepared. I'm ready for this. And talk to yourself a few moments before you walk in. You've got this. And, you know, Paul, you've got this. Okay, what are you going to do? Head up, shoulders back, deep breath, walk in with that confidence. You've got it. It's only a few seconds before you go and do something that you remind yourself you've got it. That mental moment, if you will, can make all the difference. I remember when I was giving my TED talk, Dr. Finance, if I may, I had uh, spent about three months writing the, the talk and rehearsing the talk and getting ready for the talk. And Ted, the TEDx people are amazing. They put you with a writing coach. They put you with a speaking coach. They want the very best for you and for their audience because it's going out to the world. And so I spent about three months getting ready for this. The last month and a half or so after my talk had been written, I was memorizing it, but I didn't want to bring it out as a memorized piece. I wanted to bring it out as a piece in which I, I was talking and not just repeating. So I had to make it real. And this is what most TED Talks uh, are all about, is memorize your script, but make sure that you deliver it with passion. And so I remember that day, it was the first big, I'd never spoken to a group of a thousand people, let alone be in front of cameras and it, you, to do this talk in front of the world, to have it as a permanent record of me. <laughs> Can you imagine? And so I, I got all these thoughts going on in my mind and I was chosen to be the last speaker of the day, which oh. is a great, it's a great position. Yeah. The first is, is kind of like an honor and so is the last. And the reason for it, the first sets the tone for the day. The last sets the tone for everything to come. Hey, didn't we have a great day? And this is the talk we want you to remember. And so that being the case, I had a whole day to worry about what I was going to say. And I'll tell you, I think that we're all more similar than we are different. Because I was thinking to myself, what if, what if, what if? And I had to get what ifs out of my head. Uh, later in the afternoon, I went to what was called a green room to wait for my moment to go on stage. Now, I was prepared. I was prepared. And I, when I was in the screen room, backstage, through the curtain, I could see the MC and I could see the speaker ahead of me. I was going on in three minutes. Do you know what happened? I forgot everything. I forgot my first line. I forgot my, my talk. I forgot everything. The, the stress that I had put on myself it was 2015. I could hear my heartbeat, and I was afraid that the audience could hear it. Butterflies had all come into me, and they were floating around, and I'm thinking, you don't know anything. You're going to go out there. You're going to crash. And then I reminded myself, hey, wait a minute. What have you been telling yourself in the past? You've been telling yourself, you've got this. You're ready for this. You know this. And I had to talk to myself, that self-talk. I had to say to myself, You've got this, Paul. You've got this. The speaker ahead of me had finished. She was coming off stage. The MC looked at me. He called me on stage. And I had this, this thought in my head, you've got this, you've got this, Paul. Head up, shoulders back, walked on stage, knew everything. I felt that passion and that fire. I delivered it to a standing ovation. So it's not just talking uh, to someone else. It really is about your self-talk, about what you do and prepare for. 
your day starts off with intention. A lot of people just, they, they wolf down their breakfast, throw on their clothes, grab their coffee and go out and they leave their day off to chance. If you do that, the chances are, it's not always gonna turn out the greatest. But when you st start your day off with intention, and this goes for everyone, this goes for our emergency workers, our CEOs, any entrepreneur out there, start your day off intention, intentionally. Start off with this gratitude, start off with this, these mantras, really truly believe, pick your attitude for the day, do the meditation. Your morning ritual, your morning exercise may include 10 minutes of meditation. How beautiful is that? So that you ground yourself with the universe and that you present yourself in the very, very best light and you believe in yourself. And those moments where you're going in for that big meeting or you're going in for, to ask for that job, just take a few moments and say, you've got this, you've got this. And take that moment to breathe and just put your head up, shoulders back, walk out with confidence. That makes such a big difference. Mm. That's brilliant, Paul. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Paul, I just want to wrap up your story with the next minute or so, get to the present moment. And then we're going to get into our questions. We got a lot of questions. We're going to we're going to tie into a lot of the things that you talked about today, especially your TEDx talk. Um, but I, I just want to get from how we how you became a hostage negotiator uh, to becoming a speaker, and then also the acting part. So if you can maybe summarize that up in a minute, that would be great. Okay, I'll try to do it in a minute. Uh, the acting actually, when I was in high school, um, I was very popular back then because I gained that confidence I told you about. And I remember just kind of be, I thought myself to be kind of cool. And I didn't want to do too much work. <laughs> so uh, there was a classroom on dramatic arts. And I thought, well, I don't have to do much on that. It's about acting and stuff. I can just sit back and watch everybody do it. And so I joined that classroom. I, I signed up for that classroom and I got it. And there, the first play that came out I thought, I wonder if I could do this stage acting stuff. I mean, you know, that sounds pretty interesting. So I auditioned for the lead role and I got it. And I absolutely loved the feeling I had by working with all the other actors, working with the director, working on stage and delivering the performance and having the performance appreciated. I loved all that. And so how, when how the old were you, Paul, when you did that? Um, 17, 16, 17. Oh, so you're no stranger to the stage. You, you've been uh, you've been on the stage since you were a kid. Well, what happened there, Doctor Finance, is that I I did it in high school and then I dropped it, oh. and and uh, I didn't go back to it at all. But I, my youngest daughter, uh, she developed this passion for acting when she was just eight, nine, ten years old, and she would go into these community theaters and and she would do it. And when she was about twelve or thirteen, she says, "Dad." <laughs> Dad, when are you getting back into acting? She, <laughs> and I said, well, honey, I, I don't know. Um, I was working a day job then because I had, it was in the detective office and I had a sweet spot. She says, well, are you thinking about it? And of course, this is your daughter, right? And she's asking, Dad, are you going to do this? And she's kind of got her hopes in. And I thought, um, yeah, if the right play comes along. The, other, the next day or two days later, she comes to me and Count Dracula was playing, uh, was going, being auditioned for, and they were looking for actors. And she says, well, here's a play. And I felt committed then. And so I went and I auditioned for it and I got the lead role, uh, Dr. Seward, who was on stage pretty much 95% of the time. <laughs> and I absolutely loved it. And as chance would have it, the guy who played Dracula had a, an agent in Toronto, one of the reasons I moved to Toronto. We had an agent in Toronto. He says, you know what, Paul? He says, you're good enough. I have an agent in Toronto. I think you should meet. And I'm not one to overlook opportunities. If somebody says like that, it's like the door opens and I say, yes, I should. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, I'd love to meet him. He hired me. I got a movie and I'd been doing it uh, for seriously for about four or five years. And now I do it occasionally. But I've written a script, too, that might become a movie. So I'm excited about that. So, so you actually moved to Toronto. We never covered that from the, the original town you were from for acting reasons because you. Yeah, that's, cor that's correct. Wow. I was I was auditioning two, three times a week and I was taking the go train. Uh, that's a train that just uh, runs along the line here. And it was taking me an hour and a half to get here. 
uh, and do my audition and an hour to get back. And I'm thinking, okay, you're spending all this time away from other work that you could be doing. Wouldn't it make sense that you move to Toronto? And that's the reason I moved to Toronto. And where, where does the speaking part come into to play? Because and let me, you know, load this loaded question even more. <laughs> after you, uh, after you left the, um, being a hostage negotiator and the, the police, uh, you, you actually were transitioning and into a new industry. So between acting and, excuse me, and uh, speaking, I'm sure there might have been some dull moment, uh, moments where you're not really sure what you want to do next. And, and that might have had some financial consequences as well. Um, do, do you want to talk about that transition and, and what led you to where you're at? Presently. Absolutely. absolutely. So you're a great speaker. Now you're getting paid good money. And, and um, you know, that's, it wasn't an easy journey to that, especially coming from a completely different industry for 30 some years. Uh, Dr. Finance, you nail it again. Yeah, great questions, by the way. And I love uh, how you're asking them and what you're bringing out in me is, is <laughs> really great. All right. So after leaving the police department, I got divorced, like right after I had left, uh, the, my, my ex didn't want to be married anymore. And so we got divorced and I found myself having to find work to pay the lawyers and do all kinds of stuff. So I got a job uh, with the government uh, examining uh, different cases and stuff like that, but it was only a year and a half contract. Once that was done, I had some time on my hands and I, I don't like to have idle time. So I thought to myself, what do I do? What do I do? And people had been telling me, Paul, you've got such incredible stories. You've got such story. You should write a book. And I kept saying, no, no, no. I have no interest in writing a book. And when I had this idle time on my hands after everybody had been telling me this, I got a whisper. And the whisper was, write a book. And I was in between jobs. I had nothing to do. And I thought, I don't want to write a book. And the whisper was louder, write a book. And I thought, OK, where do I start? I don't know how to write a book. So I went to a bookstore, picked up a book on how to write a book. And then I came back home and I read the first 40 pages and I thought, okay, I think I know it. And I started to write. Turns out it took a lot more than just the first 40 pages. But the point of that story is that I wrote a book that is now uh, available across the world because Harper Collins picked it up. And it was because of this whisper that told me I should write it. And it's called Take Control of Your Life. And so I thought, wow, my goodness, you can do it when you put your mind to it. Then I found, after I had done this, I found again, I, I had some time on my hands. Remarkably, I was reached by a woman from, uh, on LinkedIn who had come across my profile and she, like her job was working with Ted, but she was reaching me as an independent from Ted. And she said, I came across your profile. I see that you were a hostage negotiator. Would you be interested in speaking to a small group of business people about negotiations? This is an unpaid gig, but we were wondering if you'd be interested. So I reached out to her and I said, yeah, that sounds like fun. Never done that before. And so I did. I spoke about, I developed a, a talk and I spoke to this group of people about how we can use hostage negotiation principles in business negotiations. And I even got an actor to role play with me. And he came along for the day and he's now a very popular Canadian actor. And it worked out very well. What happened after I delivered this talk is that I was still on location with this woman and she says, you've got a fascinating background. And I said, well, thank you. And she says, tell me a little bit about what you've done. And so for me, when I tell a story, I often tell it just as a matter of fact, hey, I got on the bus the other day, or hey, my life got saved by a terrorist when I was in the Middle East. It's like, and people go, what? What did you just say? And they, because they've never experienced it. And I forget that some of the stories are pretty, pretty amazing. And so when I told her that story, she says, so you're telling me that he saved your life because of the way that you had treated him on a different occasion. And she says, I see a TED talk in this. I see a TED talk in which we can reach a lot of people and get them not to judge others and get them to be their best selves. And I thought, okay. And she, I said, well, I, I, what is a TED talk? I didn't know. And she told me about it and she says, I cannot guarantee you anything, Paul, but if you apply for this, there's gonna be about 2000 applicants. We choose 12, I won't have a say in it. I'll have one say, but it'll only be mine and I won't influence the decision. So I put in the application 
and I was selected as one of the 12 to deliver a TED talk on, you know, how, you know, how, how to deal with people and my story about how my life was saved in the Middle East. And after I gave that talk, uh, the, the audience applauded and I was approached by three speaking agencies who said, we have work for you. We have something in mind for you. And remember, I told you, I'm not one to overlook opportunities. And I said, yes, you do. And wow. I've become a speaker ever since. Wow. Yeah. Do you think this is probably going to be your ultimate career where, where your whole life's journey has led to? I am one, Dr. Finance, that likes to have his hand in many different things. I will continue to speak because I love it. I am mm -hmm. passionate about it. So far this year, I, I've spoken six times uh, across North America, and I've loved every moment of it. I have another four or five already lined up, and I just absolutely love it. But I'm also working, as I mentioned a bit earlier, I wrote a script. I had some time on my hands. Isn't it funny? <laughs> when I had some time on my hands, I was thinking, okay, now what am I going to do? And as fate would have it, I had written this book. And one of my friends from the acting community, she reached out to me and she said, Paul, I just wrote a script. Would you mind reading it? I know that you've written before. Would you mind reading my script? And I said, sure. Yeah, why not? And so she sent me her script and I read it. And I've, I'm familiar with scripts because I've had many in my hands. But I thought, well, how did she write it? Because a script is written in certain ways. Uh, it, it's, it's designed in certain ways. And I thought, that's a lot of work. And so I asked her, I said, did you use software to write your, your script with? And she said, yes, I did. And it's called Fade In. And I said, oh, okay. And so I looked at the price of Fade In, which was very reasonable at the time. It was about 75 Canadian dollars and I bought it. So now I had the software on my computer and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what are you going to do with the software? Paul? <laughs> well, you've got time on your hands. Uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> Why don't I try writing a script? <laughs> and so I wrote a script and that script has actually got a lot of attention. I'm working now with uh, my wonderful agent who has produced four Hollywood movies. One's just about ready to be released. I'm also working with a, a very, a very popular Canadian actor who's had a show on for 16 years. He's the main character. And we are looking at developing this into uh, a, a feature film. And so to answer your question, the speaking will be a passion of mine. This new project will be a passion of mine. And I have no idea what's coming next because I'm open to all the opportunities. And when I see something that I like, I'll go and I'll work my butt off to make it happen. And as a result of that whisper or people telling me I should write a book and having the whisper, I've written for. And now the script is, is coming to life. And I believe that the message here for every one of your entrepreneurs or any, anyone out there is to, to pursue your passions and to never give up. It's like taking a handful of spaghetti. <laughs> one of my friends, Stuart Knight, told me this on one of my podcasts. He says, you know what I do? He says, I, I imagine I'm taking a bunch of spaghetti and I throw it against the wall. And the, sp the spaghetti represents these different thoughts and ideas, these different entrepreneurial ideas or these different you know, writing ideas or whatever. You throw it on the wall, see what sticks, and then take it from there. So if you have these whispers or these desires, you don't want to be visited by the ghost of missed opportunities <laughs> on your deathbed who say, you know what? You could have brought us to life. And let's show you what it would have been like if you would have asked this person out or if you would have gone after this job or if you would have become that entrepreneur. Let's just show you what that would be. No, I don't want to be visited by the ghost of missed opportunities. I want to be visited by the ghost of rock and roll who say, dude, that was amazing. <laughs> what do we do for round two? <laughs> That's awesome, Paul. All right, Paul, we're, we're going to transition into the question. Believe it or not, this is totally different than what we've already <laughs> done. This is the, the questioning part uh, of the, of the uh, interview. And I got about 20 plus questions and figure about 30 seconds to a minute each. And I think we'll make good timing. You got it. Um, and, and, and I appreciate you spending the extra time today with your story because we've also went in many different directions as well. And I think it was, it was very beneficial. So great job so far. Next question. Um, and this is not really a question. It's uh, it's an opportunity for you, if you can, to give us an overview of your books. Maybe show off your uh, your your bookshelf behind you, 
as well. Maybe 30 yeah. seconds to a minute. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, the first book I wrote was called Hostage to Myself. And it really was a book on how to deal with self-sabotage. The thing that happened was when I, I self-published because I didn't believe that I could actually be successful with a, a regular publisher. So I self-published. But as fate would have it, what happened was HarperCollins picked up a copy of my book. I'd sold about 40, but HarperCollins were one of the people who uh, picked up my book and they reached out to me. And this is a one a million opportunity. They said, uh, we want to publish your book worldwide. And I said, yes, you do. And so that opportunity arose. So what, when I wrote that book, it's helped a lot of people. That brought me out to write a second book and it's called Damn It, Just Ask. And Damn It, Just Ask is uh, this one right here. It teaches people how to ask and negotiate for the things that you want in life using hostage negotiator principles and also the principles that I've developed over the years. Then I thought to myself, okay, there's another book there. And what should that book be? And so I called uh, this book, The uh, Badass Guide to Conflict Resolution, How to Deal with Conflict. Because we all, we all face conflict at some point. Why don't we look at conflict as opportunity? Opportunity to you know, to create better relationships with the people that we're in conflict with. And then I wrote a journal uh, based on my first book, and it's really the Take Control of Your Life journal. And it talks about the importance of starting your day off with intention and writing your thoughts, your deepest thoughts down and keeping a journal going. So th those are the four, four books that I have written. I'm also working on another mental wellness book and I believe it's going to outdo all the others, but uh, that's what I'm currently working on. And thank you for that opportunity. Thank you, appreciate that, Paul. All right, Paul, so real quick, I also, you, you mentioned the TEDx talk before. Can you give us a 30 second interview, uh, overview of the TEDx talk called Finding Humanity Amid Terrorism and Global Unrest that you held at uh, TEDx Toronto? I certainly can. And in 30 seconds, here we go. It really was based on the true story of how my life was saved by a terrorist. I was about to be killed. My partner and I were about to be killed. And when I was saved by this terrorist, I went back and started to think, why is it that he did that for me? I recognized him. He was one of my former students. And it occurred to me that I had treated him with dignity and respect as I had treated everyone in my classroom. And this is why he put his own life on the line for mine. And I got to thinking, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't judge everyone based on the, what we see or what we hear about them, the color of their skin, their religious backgrounds? We need to treat people with dignity and respect. And if we did that, how beautiful it would be and how much we could change the world. We don't have to agree with what everybody does, but we certainly owe people the opportunity to to give their side of the story and not to judge them and not to turn our backs on them. So that was the flavor of the talk is really treat each other with dignity and respect. Uh, there's uh, the golden rule that says, uh, treat others the way that you would like to be treated, but there's also the platinum rule that says, treat people the way that they would like to be treated. And I believe that each and every one of us wanna be treated with dignity and respect. And if we did that, we would really bring peace to the world. That's beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And I, I watched that uh, that uh, speech as well. Beautiful, beautifully done. I say great job. So th thank you, um, Paul. Next question. And maybe in one sentence, what does negotiation mean? Before we start getting into a series of questions about negotiating, in your own words, what, what is negotiating anyway? What, what does that mean? Negotiation is simply when two or more people get together for the purpose of reaching an agreement. We've been negotiating since the beginning of life. We've been negotiating every day of our lives since we were able to talk. It was like, can I have a, that piece of cake? Uh, that's a negotiation. Where would you like to go for your holidays? That's a negotiation. Everybody negotiates every day. So the negotiation is simply when two or more people get together to reach an agreement. Mm. It's simple. And that's, that's way better than Webster's Dictionary, by the way. <laughs> I checked it out this morning. I wanted to know myself. What, what, are, what do they think this definition actually means? And I like the way you put it a lot better. So <laughs> they gave five or six definitions, by the way. I'm like, eh, what's the real one? <laughs> well, the real one, you, you know, Dr. Finance, 
We all do it every day. How yeah. many times are you even asking for a little bit of a break? Hey, can you give it a little break? That's a negotiation. Yeah. It's just how we do it that matters. But yeah, it's very simple. So let's keep it simple. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. All right, Paul, next question. All right, so we're going to get into a series of negotiating questions, um, one of your expertise. How does someone become a hostage negotiator? You, to you told us the story how you became it, but like just someone off the street, how, how do you even apply to that? Is that on, uh, do they have that on those human resource websites, monster.com, looking for a job? I mean, how do you become a hostage negotiator in 30 seconds? In 30 seconds, yes. No, they don't have it on all these, these <laughs> job opportunities. You have to be able to communicate and relate to people. You have to be a good communicator, an effective and active listener, and you have to demonstrate your ability. And not, not everyone who is called to do the job can do the job. You're put through a series of tests. So how do you become one? Become the best uh, interviewer and listener that you possibly can. Be open and empathetic and compassionate with people. Know that it's really getting them out of their torment and helping them to get to where they need to be. So just develop your, your speaking skills and your listening skills. Where do you find it out though? Where do you, where do you find those jobs at? You, well, they are actually, for the most part, they are in the police services uh, and the areas that people join. So it takes a number of years to be recognized as that kind of speaker. Okay. There is the private industry that go after the pirates and go after the kidnappers and such. And they would probably be found through a number of different sources as is that XYZ company, which is a security company working in you know, this part of the world and need negotiators to negotiate with pirates or kidnappers. And then they would interview you. Uh, so you would take a roundabout way of doing that. I was looking at maybe doing that after I had retired but it really doesn't, it didn't interest me at the time, but that's how you would do it. So you could do it privately. Most negotiators do it because they've already been established in the police service or, you know, an agency like the FBI, the RCMP, whatever. Uh, and they're already there. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And next question, um, tying this to business, how should one negotiate in business? Maybe 30 seconds. Okay. How people should negotiate in business is going in and I call it the peer principle. First of all, you have to plan. You have to plan everything. You have to be prepared for everything, role play, do a bunch of stuff. The I in peer, it's P-I-E-R. The I in peer is about your intent. What is my intent? Is my intent solely on me? If it's solely on me, it's like going to a date and saying, I'm everything that you want. I've got all the answers for you. It's not gonna work. Your intent should be focused on your client. It's when you really look into what your client needs, what their pain points are, that you can make true progress. It's about exploratory dialogue. It's not about you. It's about providing a service to your client. The E in peer stands for entrance and engagement. Your first impression, make it good and keep them engaged. How do you do that? You ask questions, you get them involved, you get them to open up. And the R is in a relationship. And it's just really truly about putting your client first and doing everything that you possibly can, can to get them to open up and tell you what it is that they need to see whether or not you're a good fit. Just like the date, go on a first date, you ask questions. You don't make it all about yourself. You ask questions to find out whether or not you're a good fit and you have what the other person is looking for. It's the same in business. That's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. All right, Paul, next, next question. I, I want to tie negotiating with um, I, I know there's, there's a relationship between that and sales. What, what is, what is your thoughts on what is that relationship? So you have the sales process, you know, people are highly, you know, pitching and whatnot, and then sales in general, but then you got negotiating. So they're connected somewhere. What, what's your thoughts on that relationship? They're very much connected because sales are negotiations. As I said, when you're looking for an agreement, you're looking for a sale, you're negotiating. Now, if we take the word sales, S-A-L-E-S, -E sales, the S in, in sales could stand for servitude. I'm there to serve my client. I'm there to find out what it is that they're looking for. The A stands for asking open-ended and calibrated questions. We want to ask, what is it you're looking for? What is it you're trying to solve? What do you want out of this? 
The L is for listening, the act of listening, not listening for the intent of speaking or making the pitch. It's not about you. It's about the person across from you, your client, your customer. So L is about listening. The E is for empathizing. I want to empathize with you. So if I understand you correctly, what you're looking for, and that's the S, the summary, is summarizing everything. So don't make it about you. Nobody wants to be sold. People want a consultant, someone who's going to take their interests and say, hey, it's okay if you don't buy here. It's all right. I I don't want to put any pressure on you. This is what I have to offer. Is it a good fit for you or not? It's really about making it about your client, about your customer. And nobody likes that. I'm a closer. I want to close this thing. And and you got to buy this. No, they don't want that. We're intelligent people who will shut other people down if they're trying to sell to us. Don't try to sell. Try to serve. That's the best. Mm. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. All right, Paul. So next question is about how should someone negotiate with loved ones who are making the wrong decisions? And I just want to preface this question, especially in the past two plus years with COVID, you know, and this is not a political um, uh, podcast, but there are many people that are swaying to different sides of, you know, different, different things they're hearing on the news or whatnot. And not, not always in this case, but also in, in life in general, we might have uh, some family that are have drug problems or you know have basically they're on the wrong side of truth <laughs> whatever truth is and we know what we might know what the truth is or at least we think we do and our job is to persuade them to to not to not do drugs to, to not have self-destructive behavior to not listen to the, the wrong uh, message from the wrong source how do we convince them to do the right thing, even if they believe that they're doing the right thing, it's our job to to persuade them. Um, so, when it comes to negotiating, how, how should we? How should someone negotiate with loved ones who are making the wrong decisions? Again, another great question, Doctor Finance. And I'll start off by saying, nobody likes to be told what to do. Nobody likes to be told you got to do this, you got to do that. We've seen the results of that with countries that uh, go to another country and say, well, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. There's usually rebellion that happens. It's like, you can't tell me what to do. You can't tell me. And there's, that's when wars happen. And that's when terrorism happens because someone tries to force their thoughts and their ideas on anybody. That's not the right approach. The right approach is to lovingly go to the person, the family member that may be going through a very difficult time or that you have conflict with and just saying, I would really love to talk to you about this. Are you open to hearing me? I love you and I want to work with you. And you don't have to listen to me, but I really worry about this and worry about that. Would you give me an opportunity to share with you? I really want to hear from you. And again, it's about the intent being placed on the person who's going through something or that you believe is going through something. You want to hear from them. Tell me what you're going through. Tell me how you see this. And may we talk. And this is, this is the whole interaction thing in which you really respect the fact that they have an outlook that may be different than yours. You cannot j- keep that against them. And you, like, like I used to say, I'm not here to find you guilty. I just want to find out the truth. I want to find out from you. And we may not always agree with what people do, but we certainly should give them the opportunity to speak and to be heard. Everybody wants to be loved and accepted, listened to and heard and acknowledged. This is a basic instinct within human beings. We want to be heard. So when you approach someone, you say, I'm worried and please hear me out. I would really, I'm concerned about this, or there's been a break in our relationship and I don't want that to happen. I love you. Uh, I would love to take a few moments to talk to you about this because it matters to me and you matter to me. Tell me what you're going through and let's talk about this. And when you put your effort forward, when you, make, when you approach that family member with love and with the fact that you're not going to point a finger at them and say, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, it's their life. And that may be doing it wrong, but who are you to, you know, to demand? Because you'll never get that. It's like telling a kid, you know, like, well, you can't stop, you can't stop me, it's my life. So approach them with this love and this listening skill 
And just the compassion, the empathy. Oh, so I get it. But, you know, here's what I think. And then you're given an opportunity. When you approach and when you listen to somebody, you truly don't interrupt and you don't give them what's called nudges like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you give them encouragers. So tell me more. This kind of thing. It's so important to listen to another people, uh, another person, not interrupt them and show genuine interest, leaning in and really listening with the heart. I call it soul listening. And when you do that in a non judgmental way, in a way of love and compassion, you are going to get to your destination more often than you're not. Paul, that is a brilliant response. And I have so much more with that. Um, I'd, I'd love to spend hours just on this topic. Uh, but, you know, for sake of brevity, I just want to move to the next question, which is highly unrelated. What happens when? how do you negotiate with impossible people? And this doesn't just apply to family members. It could be anybody, but like in family situations, we all have them. We've so people like even you and I, I'm sure in our families, both of us can account for certain people that we have done all the steps as, as a, I think I would say we were one of the few in the world that really mastered negotiating, right? Like um, even with all the knowledge we have about that, we can sit in the same room with these people that could be our closest family members. We can sit in, in the room. We went through all the steps. We bended our ear for hours. We did this so many times and we've done everything we can. We did not point at them and the finger and, and say, you know, you should do this. And we empathized to the maximum degree. We did everything you just said to the maximum degree and they still haven't changed, not over a period of months or years. I mean, it, it's, it's a very long time. What do you, how do you negotiate with impossible people? At a certain point, some people exist that are out there. And I think um, there's a book called, uh, oh, geez, it's, uh, it's, it's an old book from the 20s about the stock operator. It was called so something with the stock operator. I got it listed in one of the books, but I remember he mentioned about certain people that are impossible. How do you, how do you deal? And I think Dale Carnegie talked about this as well. Um, there are, yeah, I'm sorry. It was Dale Carnegie's book, how, how to Win Friends and Influence People. They asked him that question later on. What about certain people that you can't influence me? And then he admitted later on in his life, there are these certain impossible people that you just can't influence. So I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this, this very same topic. Like, how, how, do you, how do you negotiate with those kind of people that he was talking about? These impossible people. You've tried everything and under the sun. They just won't give. Okay. First of all, uh, before I get into that answer, I want to remind everybody that there are times, if it's not a family member, we haven't negotiated with them, we may think they're impossible to negotiate with. And I've done that with the hardened criminals that I went into interrogate about murders and rapes and robberies and, and stabbings and that kind of stuff, or with hostage takers. And you, you think right off the bat, this is impossible. They, they've got a record as long as you can actually, you, 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 as long as there's room, and we'll never get through to them. That's the wrong mindset to have. The mindset is that that's a human being, and that we are more similar than we are different. And two of the greatest lessons, Dr. Finance, that I learned when I first became a police officer was this. We are more similar than we are different. So imagine yourself in the shoes of the other person. And when I started to apply this principle in my own life, as a police officer, or even in my, my interactions with other people, that what would it be like? If I were told this by this person in authority or by this family member, how would I respond if I felt this way? So putting yourself in the shoes of the other person makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. The second lesson, the greatest lesson that I, I learned in, in police work was we get what we give. And so if I give you that compassion, that love, that dignity, that respect, I'm likely to get that in return. It's worked for me. Now let's go to answering the question that you asked when you've tried everything, sit back, and this is the importance of self-evaluation or of evaluating. Did I do everything that was possible? Did I speak to that person the way that I would like to be spoken to myself? Did I keep that resentment in the tone of my voice or in my body language or in the words that I chose? Whatever is we have to examine what it is and be brutally honest with ourselves and think to ourselves, not all of us are great communicators. 
And a lot of us are judgmental. And it may sound, well, I got your best interest. Well, how did you say that? And if they're still not budging and you've examined yourself and you said, no, I approached that lovingly. I did everything, my body language, my tone of voice, the words that I used all showed compassion and they're still not budging. As Stephen Covey said, there are some people that won't and there are some people that never will. All we need to do is to put forth our best and to let the person know that we're there for them. We can't keep smacking them in the face, giving them our version of their lives. We just have to let them know, hey, I'm here for you, I love you, and I'm a, I, I, anytime you wanna talk. And remind them of that because people forget sometimes. They think they're alone. Imagine yourself when you're in a position where you feel like you're being beaten by everybody. Everybody's got this. It's my life. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. What, what, what's going on with this? We just need to remind people sometimes. I'm here for you. I love you. And I, I just want the very best for you. Hey, let me know whenever you want to talk. I'm here. That would be the best way to deal with something like that, Dr. Finance. Thank you, Paul. That was a, a brilliant response. Um, I just want to add to that. I've also found sometimes there's ways to shorten the process to get to the right solution when you realize that you've done everything you possibly can. Well, and I, I want to correct my language. Anything's possible, yeah. um, but highly probable. Uh, you know, and you've highly probable you've done everything you can. Um, there's something missing. It, it might be a character flaw. Maybe it's just the way I look, you know. Yeah. Um, it could be anything that I, I can't point my finger on. Sometimes I find a shortcut is to get someone else to say that same message, right? Like, like just look at the family, for example. Most people won't listen to you just because you're the family member. Yeah. Nothing else. They got the wall up just because you're a family member. You already got a wall on. I don't care what comes out your mouth. I don't want to hear you from my family. I can't listen to my family. I got to hear it from somebody else. So I bring Paul in. And Paul says the same thing I said. And Paul walks away with a success. And I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> because... Sometimes you got to think outside the box. If you still want the same solution, there's just a different way to do it. You might not be the person, right? I like that. So, I like so that. yeah, you, you agree with that, Paul? Sometimes, oh, one hundred percent. You're not the right. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I've had people reach out to me and say, "Would you?" Because uh, you're not connected to this, and I said, "Yes, I would." And you're absolutely right. That was brilliant, Doctor Pinas. Thank you for that. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. I just want to share real quick. I think it's a good opportunity. And Paul, I appreciate you spending extra time. I woke up this morning, actually. I had, um, so I grew up in South Philadelphia, a very, very difficult, dra uh, dramatic past in some, some cases, you know, very difficult time. Um, and, um, you know, lost boy for, for a period of my life. Mm -hmm. And I had a dream last night about uh, a friend of mine who, and I guess it was subconsciously, I was thinking about this interview and how, negotiating and and i tried you know, he had a drug problem and i tried so hard to to negotiate with him and many a lot a lot of my friends actually want to pass in from from drugs and whatnot but um in this case he was a very very close friend um and uh to this day he's, he's still alive he actually flatlined several times in his life but it was weird i was having a having a dream of us playing football and there was a third friend there and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. Like, what's what's different about this scene? I'm like, oh, I'm younger. <laughs> He's younger. <laughs> well, it's like we went right back, transported to that to around age 17, 18. And and I, I guess it, when I woke up to that dream, I was feeling it and everything. I'm, and it was about this interview. And I'm, I was thinking, how do how could I have went back and negotiated better with him and convince him that these were the wrong things to do? You know, so I don't know. Sometimes it's uh Sometimes it's not good to look into the, the rear view mirror, but it, it, it is interesting if, if, you, if you take that moment, um, maybe there's something you could have done. Maybe there's something you could have said, but like you were trying to say earlier, you can't always, you can't, you, you can do the best you can do. You can't, um, you can't make people do what they want to do. If, they, if that's the choice that they make, you got to respect that and just move on in life. 20 plus years later, I mean, you still got to move on and that's their decision. You and do, then, you do, and and yeah, I'm sorry for that. Uh, what you went through there with uh, your friend, but you're right. Uh, a lot of times we look back at the things that uh, have happened in our lives, and 
we start to doubt ourselves. What I could have I done differently? What should have I done differently? And, and that's bringing blame and shame on ourselves, which we should not do. Uh, we should not bring that blame and shame on ourselves for the past things that we may or may not have done better is we have to recognize that life is really a, a journey and that we are not the people that we were back way back when we're standing on the shoulders of the person that we were. So if I even look at back at my recent history in the last six months where I've gone back and said, you know, I, I could have done this differently. I should have done this differently. I have to remind myself, yes, I could have. And yes, I should have. What have I learned from that? What could I say now? And then I say, okay, I have to leave that behind and, and forgive myself uh, for that and know that if that situation presented itself to me now, I am so much more prepared for it. <laughs> and it, it's really going back and saying, yeah, I could have been different and I should have been different. Okay, but let me not dwell there. I, I talk to people about this. This is almost like the going to the poor me hotel where we look at, at things that have happened to us. If I went back to the poor me hotel where my father used to beat me, and say, oh, poor me, I was so beaten, I was so disrespected, I was so injured and harmed. And I spent, if, if I checked into the poor me hotel, I went in and I said, okay, I'm, I'm coming to the poor me hotel. I'm going to spend some, some time here saying poor me. Well, the bar right across the hall in that, in that hotel is the why me lounge. And the why me lounge, they have drinks at 50% off. It's like, Hey, welcome to hotel. You know, like, it's so sorry that you're here. It's, it's your past. And why not go into the why me lounge? And so we go into the why me lounge. We start drinking. Why, why did this happen to me? It doesn't, you know, it does not serve us to stay at the poor me hotel. We could go back and examine the things that have happened and say, ah, I might've been able to do this differently. Yes, I should have, but I cannot blame and shame myself for that because I'm not that person anymore. Today, I am this man, and tomorrow I'm going to be even a greater version of the man or woman I am today. And so when we learn from these things, examine them for the purpose of taking lessons from them and then applying them, not just thinking, oh, I could have done this differently, isn't that nice? No, I'm going to. I've learned. And what must, what, what must I do to become this person that I want to be? And then put the work into that person that you want to be. That's where it's all at. And it really is not about blame and shame. That serves you nothing. Go back and say, yep, yeah, okay, maybe. But we don't always know. Maybe if we would have done that, it wouldn't work either. So why spend that energy in thinking, I could have made a difference. Maybe you mm -hmm. couldn't have. Some people are so lost. As Stephen Covey says, nothing will reach them. Mm -hmm. And I know some people like that. So we have to look at the person we are today and the person we want to become tomorrow. Uh, that's beautiful, Paul. Paul, I, I, I hope, uh, I know that people listening to this are going to resonate with this. Um, I do these deep interviews, especially with great people like yourself, because I know that um, if they listen to the whole message, this is a classroom in itself. I mean, folks, you heard his story going back from the beginning and then to dissect that and see how he got to the success level to be able to answer these kind of questions with the kind of with the exact formula and there's no exact formula for negotiating but the 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 proper ingredients um if using it loosely of what it takes to succeed in life and and to be able to come to agreements with people um, of all different problem sets we've covered a few already the next the next one i want to actually um talk about is uh how should we negotiate with mother nature life itself how do we get how do we come in agreement with mother nature to get what we want in life mm. and, and make her uh make her also benefit at the same time oh, <laughs> i don't want to get too yeah. deep with this let's do about 30 seconds to a minute That's you know fun. what dr finance i just <laughs> absolutely love your questions they're so great as i've been saying throughout this wonderful interview is that when we treat others with dignity and respect when we give to others. They will usually give us that in return. When it comes to Mother Nature, we're not treating Mother Nature with dignity and respect. We're throwing our garbage into the waters. We're throwing our gar garbage on the ground. We're polluting our air. We're not treating her with dignity and respect. No wonder she's angry. No wonder the universe is angry with us. It's because we're not 
treating it with the respect that it requires and it deserves. And if we were to treat mother nature the way we would want to be, I would not want to be standing on the street and have somebody coming over, hey, and throwing dirt in my face and throwing the garbage and here, I've got a Coke. There you go in your face. There you go. And oh, you want some smoke? Here we go. And I was smoking my face and all this kind of stuff. I wouldn't want to be doing that. Why am I doing that to the very planet that is getting me life, that is allowing me to eat from the earth and to breathe the air? But I'm polluting that air and I'm polluting that dirt and that earth. I'm not treating it with dignity and respect. It's time that we, again, go into that self-examination role. Uh, uh, self-examination mode is what I want to say and take a look at the things that we're doing that can be changed because there are certain things we cannot control but certain things we can and what we can control is the way that we're treating mother nature the way that we're treating the universe and we're not treating the universe and mother nature with the respect that they deserve and it's time that we change that attitude if we want to be treated with the respect that mother nature wants to give us that has given us from the very beginning of time it's time that we start treating her with that and saying, yes, I will treat you with this respect. We will stop doing this and we will work collectively at making you happy and then you will make us happy. That's brilliant, Paul. I don't think you could have said it better. I mean, because I, I often, like I'm not a religious person, but just take the God perspective. Let's say to assume there is a God or, or gods. Let's make it simple and call it one God. Yeah. If we're negotiating with God right now, as a human, not just us individually, but humanity as a whole. I agree. He's probably, or, or she's probably so pissed off at us. <laughs> but, yeah. Like, what the, what are you guys doing down here? Like, you know, get, I gave you get it life. together. <laughs> I gave you life and I gave you opportunity and you're spoiled little brats going around. And it's all about me, me, me. Well, we know in negotiation, if you make it about me, 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 the person sitting across from me is going to say, I don't want you, you, you. And if you, there is a spirit of God, a universe, whatever you will, will call it, it's not a man or a woman. I don't know exactly what it is. And we're not going to get into the religious part of it. However, yes, you're right. This, this energy, this, this being, this creation, this whatever is probably looking at us now, not probably, is looking at us with this disappointment and the tear in its eye uh, saying, I gave you life and you're treating me this way. Wow. I'm so, I'm so disappointed. Uh, <laughs> that's why we're doing this podcast. Maybe we can make an impact. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate your, your patience with my questions. Um, all right. So clubhouse, right? So there's a lot of competing clubs on clubhouse right now. Um, maybe 30 seconds. Is there a way to negotiate? We've had thousands of clubs, you, you, you know, you've, we've started with, uh, originally, you know, a lot of really giant ones. And now they're, they're really only down to a handful or less of really good big clubs. Like how do how do there's a lot of drama in clubhouse right now. How do we get that, strip that away and, and allow these clubs to, to work with each other, not against each other. Cause to me it's disintegrating. Like I'm actually just considering just me and I have my co-host diamond and just, just us two. And that's it. I don't even like, you got a great room, but you know, these, I'm talking about the bigger, the bigger uh, rooms have been going on. We've both had me and diamond River rooms over a year now, um, but there's very few of them left. And what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Paul, how do we get everyone to be on the same page, negotiate with each other in clubhouse, maybe 30 seconds or so. Yeah. Diamond diva. I just got a shout out to her. She's an amazing woman. Great co-host for you. Your room is, is just absolutely amazing. And Thank what you. you do, what you do is you serve, you serve. We cannot, I believe, get the entire clubhouse community to work together. Why? Because we have all these different personalities and these different intents. We know that there are some thieves and some con artists and some it's all about me rooms and let's put up a room on anger and hatred and point the finger at this person, that person. We collectively as individuals and as people who run rooms uh, or even you, if you're on clubhouse, there's a six letter word, word called choice, C-H-O-I-C-E. We get to choose the rooms we go to, choose the rooms we participate in and make a difference. And if you jump into a room that's toxic and you stay there, it's going to toxify you, it's going to hurt. 
And so what we need to do is find those clubs that are like-minded. It's like finding your tribe. If you find, if you surround yourself with a bunch of idiots, chances are you are either an idiot or you'll become an idiot. <laughs> and and it, it's because it's transference. It, yeah. it, we are collectively um, the five people that we hang around with. And it's true of Clubhouse is that when we find those, those rooms that are in line with us, we collaborate with them. Maybe we start another room, but we get our tribe of people that believe in the way that we do. Some rooms out there I see, and they've got a thousand people in them and they've got 1500 people in them or whatever. And if I jump in and I am hearing somebody yelling at somebody, oh, yeah. calling somebody down, Nonsense. you're an idiot, I get out. Yeah. I get, there's a leave quietly <laughs> button and I leave. I, I would love to shout, I'm getting out of here, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not on stage. But yeah, it, it's really about choosing the rooms that serve you and that build you up with the tribe that serve you and build you up. It's really about finding that. Mm -hmm. And we can do that by using programs like Instagram and putting on live maybe videos saying, we've got a room and it's about this and we welcome you, whatever. But try to find those rooms and those tribes that you resonate with and stay out of the ones that you don't because you're gonna find anger there. We can't change everybody, but we certainly can control the things within our control. Can't control them, can control us and our choices. Thank you, Paul. Brilliant response. By the way, I'm becoming a big fan of your room because of what you just said. Like I'm, I'm getting unattracted to even the bigger rooms that were successful. So really it's down to just like two or three. And then I'm looking at smaller rooms now with just great quality. And you, and you happen to be a master at that space. So, um, you. you know, I, like I've been in your room, I think four times in the past few weeks and uh, you know, just, I just like what you're doing. So it Thank doesn't, you. you don't need 500 people in a room. You got 40 people and they're all great. That's yeah. good enough. That's great, actually. So um, thank you, Paul. Next question real quick. Why do you, why do you love Clubhouse so much? Maybe 30 seconds. Well, because it's given me a wonderful opportunity to meet some incredible people from across the world that I otherwise would not have had. It also gives me a platform to speak my passion to other people and to learn from other people by dropping into their rooms. I've learned so much from your room, Dr. Finance, for example. I remember seeing yours and seeing Diamond Diva. I didn't know who you were, but I knew Diamond because I had been, you know, she and I follow each other and I've been on her stage and I thought, well, I'll drop in here. And then hearing you and, and what you were doing and how you're helping people, I've learned so much from you. And I gotta say that it has been life transforming for me. I met such incredible friends and uh, just this one beautiful person that uh, has become a big part of my life. So much good has come out of that because I stay away from the rooms that are toxic. I meet the people who I am drawn and attracted to and I learn. I learn, I share, and I enjoy. And it's a platform that I get on and say, yes, if I'm a little bit lonely at night, what am I going to do? Can I watch the tube? Why don't I go on to Clubhouse and talk to people? And it came at a time in our lives where we were shut down and we needed so much to be seen, oh, not so much to be seen, but to be heard and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And this platform gave it to us. And I developed this, this real like for this. And because it does educate me, it, it has helped me meet new people that I never would have met before. And I've collaborated with people and I met people like you and, and gone to rooms like yours. So it's just a, an amazing platform. It really is. It's what you make of it, not mm -hmm. what it makes of you. That's a true testimony for Clubhouse. I mean, when, when we get on the biggest stage with the owners, and I think that's coming pretty soon, they've been contacting me in the background, a lot of the content creators um, department. So I got a feeling that'll happen pretty soon and we'll be collaborating. I want to bring what you just said right to this to the to the head of the, the organization because that's an extremely important conclusion I agree with. So thank you. And, and Paul, just switching briefly to speaking, how do you become a great speaker? Maybe 20 seconds or so. You serve your audience. You you find within yourself a story, a number of lessons that you've learned from that, something you've gone through, and then you share it with your audience. You make it resonate with them. It's a teachable opportunity that you have to deliver with passion. It's about finding your story, 
finding the lessons that you've learned or the things that you've learned from that story, and then going to share it with an audience and truly connecting with your audience. So it composes storytelling, lessons, and serving, and educating, and connecting. And I tell you, when you get into telling your story and what you went through, and I've told you several of the stories that I went through and what I learned from them, how I grew from them. Imagine telling this to an audience of a thousand people or 500 people, or even 50 people, it doesn't matter. You're telling your story. You're giving the lessons that you learned from them. You're asking them how that applies to their life and you're helping them to just move to a better place. That's what storytelling and speaking is about. Thank you, Paul. That's, that's brilliantly said. And folks, if you wanna see Paul uh, speak where he's actually coming to clubhouse. I believe it was uh, July 15th. Yes. Um, so he'll be on our Friday night famous stage, uh, July 15th. He'll be the main guest speaker. So the whole stage is dedicated to Paul. It's a six hour stage, but Paul's going to be speaking from uh, seven to nine, roughly speaking PM Eastern time. And um, yeah, we're going to take a lot of these discussions uh, full gear there. So it'll be lots of fun. All right, Paul, thank you so much. Um, next question about speaking. So I, I got a series of questions left. I figure if we can cut it down to maybe 20, 30 seconds, we can wrap this up. Yep. Um, how, how does, uh, yeah, I want to check on your time too. Well, how, how are you doing? Are you okay I'm doing to... good. I'm doing good. I'm, I'm modifying one of my books. So I, I'm just going to go back and do some more writing. Okay. All right. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Paul. So the next question, how does a speaker acquire more gigs and make more money? So let's take the great speaking thing and, and take it to the monetary form. How do you, how do you start making more money going from that $500 or even free speech, the five hundred dollars, to thousand, to ten thousand, to twenty, to fifty thousand, or more. Well, first of all, know your value, and and be very honest with yourself. How good of a speaker are you? Did you develop the skills necessary to reach and influence an audience and connect with an audience? So really, know what it is that you have, and what makes you unique, perhaps from the others. Now, for me. I've got many areas of expertise, for example, but a lot of people reach out to Chris Voss because Chris Voss is a hot, former hostage negotiator. He's written a very popular book and they'll ask him to speak, but he's at a level, he's quite high. I'm as good as Chris, <laughs> I would say that, and he might dispute that. However, my, my price range is a little bit lower than his. And so people will come to me and say, well, you're a hostage negotiator, you've got this, you've written a book and we'll go for you. The way in which you get the gigs is by knocking on doors, by making yourself available, and by letting people know that you're out there. You do this through LinkedIn. You do this by collecting a number of different speaking agencies and contacting them and sending in your resume to be seen. You get people to comment on your talks that you've given. So for example, I've given several talks this year and I've asked people for testimonies, either video testimonies or regular testimonies, which I'll post on LinkedIn, which I'll post on social media. I make myself available out there, but knocking on doors and just letting, and it's okay. A lot of people are gonna reject you. A lot of these big agencies are gonna say, well, we don't know who you are yet. We don't know who you are yet. It's all right. Remember, if you don't try, you don't get, you always miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So knock on the door. If they say, no, don't take it personally. It's just, it, it's data. Okay, what do I do differently? And a lot of people take things so personally, it's data. If you are refused, it doesn't mean that you're over. It just means that you go to the next thing. You knock on the next door. You come back to them a month or two later with something different. You just keep on moving, but get yourself out there and start. If you're a new speaker, Start going on stages, schools, community events, churches, or whatever. Develop your skills. I started out uh, getting nothing for my, my talks. Then I started out $500. Wow, $500 for an hour? I've never made $500 for an hour. And then it was $2,500. Are you kidding? $2,500. Then it was $7,500. And then it was $1,250. Uh, like, gosh, you're looking and it just keeps going up and up because you know your value and you develop that skill. It's not something that you just can do once in a while. You've got to live this stuff. You've got to really, truly believe in yourself. You've got to want it bad enough. The way that you get yourself out there is you keep knocking on doors, making yourself available, and delivering something of value. 
And the way that you do that is you examine yourself again and you develop on the skills that need to be developed on. What must I do to become the speaker that stands out? And then you go for it. You do it. Got to want it bad enough. That's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Brilliant, brilliant. All right, bro Paul, before we get into the temple questions, uh, last question on this sort. How can someone become an extremely part-time actor while maximizing their income? So this, I'm playing to your acting part right now. How do you, how do you make billions of dollars and, and only have to jump in a movie part-time here and there? <laughs> well, I, I don't think I have an answer to that one, Dr. Finance. <laughs> that one kind of stumps me. What I can say about that is if you're a part-time actor, it, it, have you got your priority straight? If you want to become a, an actor, like an actor that makes money, an actor that is consistent, an actor that works, then you've got to throw yourself 150% into that. And the other things are, set, are, are not going to be secondary. There is no fallback. It is all about putting your energy and your time into becoming the best full-time actor that you possibly can be. There's an actor um, that I respect, and uh, I, he's a very good friend of mine, and he's becoming very, very popular in Canada. His name is Eric Hicks. I had him on my podcast, and Eric said it this way. He said, I had no money. And yes, I would work part-time jobs as a server or whatever. He said, but every dollar that I got went into my acting. And I wanted this so bad that there was nothing that I could fall back on. He was going to become a uh, something to do like a doctor like and and he was about to become this doctor when he decided to change his career and go into acting by a number of situations that happened and he became this actor and for seven or eight years he didn't get any big jobs he got small little jobs not paid just small little things but he kept at it and he told me i wasn't ever going to give up now he is on so many different shows and movies, and he's starting to build his name. The thing is, if you want it, you whatever it is that you want, and if you want it bad enough, you focus and it's 150%. As uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, there is no backup plan. There's not a second plan. If this doesn't work out, no. It's that plan that you want, and you go for it 150,000% of the time. There's no fallout. There's no, if this doesn't work. Because that mentality, if this doesn't work, will give you an out. Oh, this isn't working, so I'm going to go for this. So many people quit because they have a backup plan. Don't have a backup plan. Just go for what it is you want. Pour your heart and soul into it. Remember, at the end of your life, you're not going to be wanted to be visited by the ghost of missed opportunities who say, you were that close. You were that close, and you gave up. You gave up. Why did you give up? You don't want that. Arnold Schwarzenegger just nailed it. He said, I didn't have a backup plan. There was no backup plan. It was me, 150,000% going for what I wanted. Nothing was going to, no backup plan. Backup plans set a little mental note in you that there's a door out. Now, you can't have that door. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Brilliant response. Paul, we're going to move into some, some what I call the temple questions. I've asked it to everyone on this podcast for the most part, including you know, Hall of Fame speakers, uh, two-time Super Bowl champions, you name it. So, um, Paul, uh, can one book change the world? As an author, I, th I think you have a pretty good opinion on this. Can one book change the world? I believe that, yeah, I believe that one book can change a huge part of the world, but not the world completely. Okay, thank you. Uh, you want to add to it? Yeah, sure, I'll add to that. Let's take a look at the Bible, for example, uh, or any of the religious books out there. They have the potential to change the world, and yet we are such different people. And we all come from different backgrounds with different beliefs. One book can make a significant difference in such a huge populace. However, I have not seen the one book that has changed the world. Is it coming? If it's a good book and it changes the world for the better, I pray that it does, <laughs> but these wonderful books that these religious books, and I'm not just using the Bible, there are the Quran and all kinds of books out there have changed millions and millions and millions of lives, but they have not changed the world. I believe that every, we're not going to be able to do that with one book now. I hope it comes, as I said. However, we are such different people with such different backgrounds. 
that not everybody is going to want to sit at the same soup table and, and drink the soup that's before them. They're going to want a different soup. And even though that one is popular with the most of the world, they're still going to want what it is that they want. And they may not accept the soup that you, you offer them. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Paul, one, what, what role has networking played in your life? Maybe 20 seconds. Yeah, networking has made a significant difference for me because I have met so many people from the people that I've met. <laughs> it, it's about, and it's also about making yourself available and, and knocking on people's doors. For example, I've, I've reached out to some very popular actors or very popular people and said, hey, my name is Paul and I, I, I love what you do and do you think we could talk or whatever? And it's amazing how many people will say yes, because you made the effort to reach out and you have something to offer them as well, because you're like-minded. So when you connect with people, with people who can make a difference in your life, it helps because they will connect you to other people who will connect you to other people. And we are, what, two or three degrees of separation? And uh, we can connect to just about anybody through networking through the importance of reaching out to people by taking risks, even at the expense of being told no. If you send something out to a very popular actor, actress, whatever it is that you, writer, and they say no, it's okay. You don't give up, but you try to network because network will take you to where you want to be. Thank you, Paul. As an uh, extension of that, is mentoring important? And who are some of your mentors? Maybe 20 seconds. Yes, mentoring is very important. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the experience that others may have. Uh, there's a, a great mentor that I have, and I met him on Clubhouse, Glenn Morshower. And Glenn Morshower is an American actor, for those of you who do not know, but Glenn is a brilliant man. And I reached out to him and said, would you mentor me? And he said, yes, I would. And I believe that mentorship gives you perspective, gives you different opinions, gives you the experience of other people. We only have one life and there's only so much that we can do, but the person that you ask to be a mentor or the person that you mentor to, they're different experiences and they will give you the encouragement, the guide light, that everybody's got a light within them that they shine into other people. And Glenn has been that light for me. So yeah, I think it's very, very important that we reach out to people and that we get mentors to help us get to the next level. That's a brilliant response, Paul. And by the way, yeah, Glenn was actually a main guest speaker last summer and we blew the lid off the top with that stage that night. So it was in incredible. Um, I actually, I, I just got an idea. Maybe we can, we can talk about his offline, but have him as a, ask him if he wants to be a co-host to your stage. He knows me very well. Like he's been in my stage many times, but um, I would, I would love I think that would really make that room incredible. Oh, I'll give him a call for sure. Yeah, I think that's great. He and he knows Forbes too. Forbes Riley. She's a she's a the permanent co-host. One of the only honors honorary co-hosts that I've actually made permanent in the room. So they're good friends too. So I yeah I I know uh, Forbes and I've had her on my podcast. I also had her daughter McKenna on my oh podcast. McKenna. Yeah, McKenna. Yes. And uh, she was brilliant. I've got her on my podcast and she's just a brilliant young woman. But Forbes is amazing. Yes. And she's gone through a lot, as we all know. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Paul, only a few more questions. We're almost done. Um, what are your favorite financial books, if any? Business, money, investing? You know, you can lump them all the same. Maybe 20 seconds. You know, I don't. I don't have <laughs> That's okay. That's I know. Okay. I, I, I don't because I, I don't look at... Uh, I've only begun really to, to look into finances. Uh, I've had so many other things, but um, I don't have a, a, a favorite book. Like Think and Grow Rich, uh, that's, that's a big one. Um, yeah, you can count that. that that's it, yeah, I, I can count that. But yeah. I, I like to look, and I'm delving into this financial thing a lot more these days. So yeah, I, I'm, on a, I'm on a journey there. <laughs> you know, Think and Grow Rich is one of those books I, I find really funny it, it can fit in several categories it can it can fit in the academic version of finance but it can also it also is the the grandfather so to speak of the uh, uh, of the science of success um but even though modern finance wasn't started till 1950 think and grow rich was 1937 i i definitely i consider that a part of of finance because it, it does it talks about a lot of things that they don't talk about in modern finance and in, in the subject of finance in universities. They're not, that's not found. You don't find 
Napoleon Hill in textbooks and finance textbooks. It should be, but it's not. Dr. Finance, have you heard that book, The Greatest Salesman in the World or something yeah. like that? By yeah. Ago, 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 the, the author, I'm trying to think, it's, it's an old book. Yeah. Uh -huh. And the principles in it, I remember reading that years ago, and I love the principles that he had to bring forth. So that was a good financial book for me. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I like that. Um, well, th thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Paul, next question. Uh, do we need money to survive? Maybe 20 seconds. Wow, uh, that's a loaded question. And I do believe, no, I don't believe that we need money to survive. I do believe that we, money is nice to have and that it buys food and clothes and the things that we need. But I also believe that there are people out there that can help us to survive uh, by opening their hearts. And, and we see examples of that every day in which people are helping each other to survive and helping each other to get to where they want to be. Money is important, as we know, it makes the world go round. Uh, it's nice to get it, but I, do we need it to survive? Wow, that's a, I, I got to give that some thought. Um, without it, we, we depend on others. I don't know how to answer that, Dr. Finance, I don't. That was a good, it was definitely a good try. Thank you, Paul. Um, so Paul, I'll, I'll tell you about this a little bit. My, my last, my last book called the survival of the richest. Um, I, I married survivalism, finance, economics, biology, and, uh, related it all together. And, um, one of the conclusions I had, it is necessary, but what you brought up was a good point. I called that term survival by a third party. So just like a parent to a child, the child needs the money of the parent, right? Mm -hmm. In order to survive. Um, same idea, you can take a, a, another independent person and survive off the money of someone else, even if that person's an adult. But if you take that, that person who they're surviving off, that third party out of the equation, right? They have to be able to produce money on their own. Yes. Yes, you know, you're right about that. And that's a brilliant answer. Thank you. Yeah, but no, that, that was that was definitely a great try. I appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. And that was that was a great observation as well. You, you know, that's that's one way you can survive by taking other people's money. <laughs> let, that, let them pay for the bill. It's, it's sad, though, because it's sad. It, it's sad because we see that in a lot of people who are homeless. And, you know, it, it, it's it's very, very sad. But that's another conversation onto, onto its own. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Great response. Paul, next question. Is finance necessary for everyone? And I'm talking about the science of finance, not um, funding finance like people commonly misconceive it to be. Yes, it is. I believe that finance is so important. For many, many years, I neglected that part of my life, you know, thinking that I had a steady job and a steady income and why should I have to worry about that? But as we know, in a moment, in a moment everything can be taken away from you. You can find yourself with nothing. And to understand financing, to understand investing, to understand how to bring in multiple streams of income is so very important because life is so unpredictable. Everybody up until a couple of years ago thought, hey, I got it all. I've got this great business. I got this. I got money coming in. I got no worries. And then the world said, no, you do. Yeah. Yeah. Guess, guess what? I'm taking it away. I'm taking it away. And for those people who had one stream of income, they, many of them have lost everything. Uh, but not only did they lose their financial uh, thing and, and their possessions or their houses or their jobs, they lost hope. Mm. That's a big thing to lose, man. And so to understand financing and to understand the importance, which I'm starting to learn, thanks to many great people in my life, thanks to rooms like yours, is starting to learn that it's important to be able to think intelligently about where you invest your money, how many different places you invest your money, and what security you can build for yourself so that your future can be certain that you are not going to lose everything and that you're going to be okay and that you're going to be able to help others by doing so, helping yourself. Thank you, Paul. Brilliant, brilliant response. Paul, three questions left. Um, well, actually, this, this one counts as two and one. How important <laughs> is having a purpose in business and what is your purpose? Well, it is so very important to have a uh, purpose because 
if you have no purpose, what is your vision? Where are you going? Are you just blindly going down the road, hoping to get to a destination? Do you have a navigation map to get you to where you want? Having purpose is really setting out an intent for yourself. Um, it requires action. It requires making a plan. And it is important how vision, how purpose has worked in my life is that I know what my mission is. And my mission is to improve the lives of others. And I do that in multiple ways. And I have that, that purpose. And I also have that vision. And I have a roadmap a navigation system that will get me to where I want to be by the work that I put into it. It's so vitally important to have a purpose. Life without purpose is life without meaning. And we are here in this life. It's a beautiful gift, but it's also an assignment. When we are born into this world, we are given an assignment. Where do you want to be? What can you do? How can you improve the lives of others? How can you improve your life? You have an assignment. Your assignment gives you purpose. And your purpose gets you to where you want to be. Mm, that's brilliant. Paul, and I, I like how you use the word assignment. It, it is true. It's kind of like, you know, we're born. We got a task we got to do. You know, not, not only do we have a reason, but we've got something to do. It's an assignment. We're, we were assigned something like homework. You know, mm -hmm. you're born and we got to get our homework done by the time you're dead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> I like it. So thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Two more questions. What would you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so and why? I want my film out there. Uh, my film, it, my movie, I want that out. That's one of the great things in my life. I want to continue working on my speaking and getting more engagements because that brings passion and life into my life. I want to write more books that will help people to deal with their self-sabotage and and to help them in their journey, in their mental wellness. And I wanna make a difference in this world. And that is my, not only my 10 year plan, it's my 50 year plan or how many years I have on this world. Um, I want it bad enough that I'm putting the work into it. And I'm constantly open to different opportunities and creating opportunities where some don't exist. So I'm gonna keep on working towards that, Dr. Finance. And these are things that are passionate to me, the film, has a message, has a purpose. It will make a difference in the world. The books will make a difference in the world. My speaking will make the, a difference in the world of the people that I speak to. It will make a difference. And that's what I'm after. Thank you, Paul. Um, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm list, listening to everything you said. I also was thinking, you know, I you think you're like the 60, 65th episode, something like that. And <laughs> Every one of the people that have been on my show, and Dr. John D. Martini put this way of thinking into my head. Um, he's a guy from the, the movie The Secret. He was on here um, along with several other secret people. But he, um, he said, you know, inspiration comes from within. Motivation comes from without, right? So people who are inspired, they don't need to be motivated because there's this fuel already happening. It's like the, the engine was already winded up, right? And as I, was thinking, as I was listening to you, I was thinking, you know, everybody that came on here is actually inspired. You know, they're not motivated. They're, every one of them is inspired. Like you get up every day, I'm, I'm guessing based on what you said, and you're ready to go. You got your mission. Like you, you don't think twice about it. You don't need to be winded. You don't need motivation from anything. You already know what you're going to do, right? Like, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, just a little additional add on as I'm hearing you, it's, it's just great to know that I'm in the presence of so many people that have been inspired, which is a rare uh, quality, I think, unfortunately, in the majority of the planet. But once you get that inspiration, like the way that you're inspired to, to go about your purpose, you said 50 years. I mean, you didn't say, you said it so confidently, not 10 years, 50 years. This is what I want to do forever, pretty much, you know? And, yeah. You know, and, and that's that takes a lot of guts to say something like that and a lot of knowing, a lot of understanding of who you are. So that's inspiration <laughs> that's coming from within. It's 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 a it's a it's a great, great feeling. And I yeah. share that with you, too. So I, I know it takes one to know one. I know what that is to get up and tiptoe like Warren Buffett says. He tiptoes every time he wakes up in the morning, <laughs> he knows what he has to do. <laughs> I love what you just said, because you're right. Uh, you you have a tribe of people that you have attracted to your podcast 
And these are people who have lived through life and have experienced different things and have learned from some of the, we call them failures, I just call it data. It's not a failure, it's just information, data. It's like, what do I do now? And you've had people who have gone through a series of data learning opportunities who have come to a point where they are inspired to make a difference in the lives of others and in, in our own life. And I believe that we can learn from that and that we need to build that inspiration. So let's not look at things as failures. Let's look at it as data, information, and move on. But if you live a very comfortable life from the very beginning where you're given everything, you're not going to make much out of your life. You're not going to have that life that is really full of rich experience. You're going to have a life. It's the people who have gone through the battles, who have gone through the hardships, who have learned from the data that they've experienced and applied it to their lives and built them into. Those are the people, the hard lives become the happier lives. And it's because of what we, we believe it to be. And we build that fire within us that we want to share with other people. And there's uh, Leonard Cohen, and I won't take up too much time. Leonard Cohen was a Canadian uh, music artist and singer. He wrote that wonderful song called Hallelujah. And he also wrote a song back in 1995 and Leonard Cohen suffered from, from depression at times. There's a lyric in, in a song called Anthem that struck me from the 90s. And he said, there's a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets through. And that meant so much to me because everybody has suffered their cracks and some of us have suffered their breaks, but through our cracks, other people can shine their lights into our lives. Mm. They, they can do that, but we also can shine our lights into the cracks of others. And I think that that's what builds spirit. And that's what builds inspiration is that we share the light within us into the cracks of others, just to help them to get through this thing called life, which is not easy. It's not easy for a lot of people and it's never going to be, but we're there to support and help each other. You brought this up earlier, Dr. Finance, is that we're born into a family that helps to support us, that feeds us, that helps us. And let's remember that we're not born into pods, we're born into families. And we're meant to connect and to depend on one another to get us through this thing called life. So we've got this light, let's shine it into the inspiration. Let's make it into inspiration so we can inspire others to reach where they wanna be and to live the life that they deserve to live. No, that's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. I love that quote, by the way. That's, that's an incredible, incredible quote. It's so true. Thank you, Paul. Last question, Paul, about legacy. What would you like to be your legacy to this world? If you can write it on your tombstone and, you know, let's, let's say that you're, you're, you're dead now. You passed into the next world, but you can come back for a second and just stare at your, your tombstone and exactly the way it wanted to be. Like, what, what would you have want? What do you want to stare at on that tombstone to make sure everybody in the world for the rest of life after your life can see it? Paul made a very good difference in this world. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. And Paul, I would like to conclude now. First of all, I want to thank you. I'm so honored to have you here. I'm honored to share many stages on, on Clubhouse with you. And I'm looking forward to sharing so many more. Uh, I've known you probably for at least a year now. I actually, when I was growing up on Clubhouse, I was, I, I watched you on big, really big stages. and I only had like 50 followers. So you already were, were kicking it back then, but it wasn't until like the past, I'd say month, two, three months, we really started to, to deeply connect. So um, appreciate having you into my life and i um, looking forward to the stage July 15th. I think that's going to be a really cool. Well, actually, let me, I'm sorry. I want to make sure I get this right because if there are people listening, I do want to make sure that I give him the right date. Um, was it July 15th, Paul? Uh, yep, I'm just looking at it myself. It's July uh, July 15th, uh, which yeah. is a Friday at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, great. Clubhouse. So, folks, yeah, the, the room starts about 6, 6.30 roughly. Sometimes I start earlier, it depends, um, p.m. Eastern Time. But whole, Paul will be on roughly about, and I try to say roughly because it depends there's a dance to this. Uh, we start when the when the music begins, and sometimes the music don't begin until we get enough people in the room. So I'm, <laughs> I'm dancing with no music so <laughs> for a little bit. But Paul gets in there. Uh, he'll be in there roughly around 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. So we'll have him for a good two hours. Um, so check it out July 15th. 
2002. So if you're listening to this 2000 years from now, you missed it, but you got the recording. So thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate you being here. I'm going to leave the floor to you. Anything else you want to say, share, promote? Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Well, I first want to thank you, Dr. Finance, for having me on your wonderful show and for the work that you're doing. I love your clubhouse room and the difference that you're making in people's lives through education and through financial education. Uh, I, I love what you stand for. And I really, truly appreciate being on this show. I just want to leave all your listeners with uh, a couple of thoughts. And I, I want to revisit what I've said, because I think that these two lessons are very, very important. Number one, we are more similar than we are different. And so what, whatever your business transaction is or family uh, negotiation is, remember to put yourself in the shoes of the other person, uh, to feel what they may be feeling. And one of the ways that we do this is by asking questions. And so make sure that you remember that the person sitting across from you is more similar to you than they are different. The other one is that you get what you give. I want to remind people of that. And so if you give people service, if you really make them first, if your intent is based on them to help them to get to where they want to be, this is the way that you get success. If you give of yourself, you're going to get that in return. If you give love and dignity and respect, you'll get love and dignity and respect in return. If you give anger and you're, you know, not unchangeable opinion on this, you're going to get that in return. You get what you give. And I, I believe that successful people all get to where they want to be when they first help other people get to where they want to be. That's how we get to where we want to be. So those are the lessons I would like to leave you with. That's brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Paul, where can they contact you for more information, your website, um, social media? Yes, thank you. My website is very simple. It's www.j, J is in John, Paul, P-A-U-L, Nado, N-A-D-E-A-U, dot com. So it's jpaulnado.com. That will take you to my main web website. The other website that you may want to visit, and I, I encourage you to, because it's very much like Dr. Finance's uh, web, uh, his, his podcast, is my podcast site. It's called inspireus.ca. So inspireus.ca. Those are two ways of reaching out to me. If you Google me, a bunch of stuff will come up on the internet uh, along with the contact uh, email for me. So those are the ways. Yeah, a little about your podcast, Paul. What, uh, how long have you been running that for? I've been running that for about two years. And the reason that I ran it, Dr. Fine asked, was that when COVID hit, I had intention, uh, intended at, at the very beginning to put people on a stage here in Toronto, Canada that had inspirational stories that would help others to get through some of the uh, setbacks and adversities and difficulties that they've gone through. So I had stages that were lined up and I had a few speakers that were lined up and I was going to invite people to come and be inspired by other people's stories because we all have a story. Everybody has a story, and many of us have a story with a happy ending because we did the work to get through it. So this is my idea. Then COVID hit, and COVID told me, slapped me in the face and said, uh-uh, you ain't doing this thing. You ain't going on stage. And I thought, okay, what do I do now? So life has thrown me this, okay, what do you do now? And so I set my mind to it, and I thought, ah, a whisper. Somebody had told me before, start a podcast. I listened to the whispers, which... Glenn Morshower talks about so much in his rooms. Listen to the whispers. Yeah, and so I started that. a podcast called Inspire Us to help people get through COVID. And it has been very successful. I've had many amazing people who have gone through hell and back. But as I think it was Roosevelt who said, when you find yourself going through hell, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many episodes? What episode number are you up? I think I'm up to 76 or uh, my, no, I think I put up number 79. It's wow. in the queue. Number 79 is in the queue, but I'm slowing down on that. We're through COVID for the most part. And so my purpose was to help people through this very, very difficult time. Those podcasts will be there forever. I'm now focusing perhaps on a crime podcast, which has been whispered into my ear uh, <laughs> because I, I know a lot about it. And I can talk about crimes and I can talk about, you know, who did it and how they could have 
interrogated that person differently. So I'm, I'm focusing perhaps on that, but I'm not sure. I have the film, which is number one, along with my speaking, which is uh, also number one. So I have two number ones that I'm working on. And uh, so, yeah, I got about 79 uh, different. Right now you can access about 75. Wow, that's really good. That's, Thank you. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's well. Look at the all the brilliant questions that you've put together for your guests that stimulate conversation and get people opening up and sharing different ideas. It's a masterclass. Every one of your podcasts, Doctor Finance, are a masterclass. And if people sat and took notes, they would learn something and they could apply it to their lives. But that takes time. You have. You have to schedule it. You have to reach out, get your mm -hmm. guests, find out whether or not they're a good fit for your podcast. And you know, some of them are not. Some will say, hey, I'd love to be on your podcast. Who are you? I'm a criminal and uh, yeah. I'm still a criminal and I'm a bad person, but I want the exposure. And you got to say, no, no, no. I don't want you on my podcast. So you find <laughs> the people who are a good fit. And then you develop the questions. You make sure that they're available. You ask for their headshot, their bio. You do all this work. Research, and, a lot of research, listening oh, to interviews, yeah. reading about them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a full-time job, but it's a great job. And I encourage people to, uh, to start their own podcast. There are a million ones out there, but guess what? It's like loaves of bread. We go in the store, there's a million one out there, but there's one brand that you're going to like, and you're going to pick it up every time because it serves you. And so your podcast is serving an audience that are drawn to you. Mine is serving an audience is drawn to me. So yours can serve an audience that's drawn for you. But remember, Dr. Finance and I can tell you right now, it's a lot of work, but it's <laughs> worth it. It's worth it. Everything worthwhile is worth it. Well, thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Paul, we're, we're going to close out here. Folks, you've been Dr. Anthony Cronin at 4.3. You've been watching the Dr. Finance Live podcast. Uh, go by Dr. Finance. Here's my website, drfinance.info. Check that out. I'm going to put the podcast for this episode on YouTube, YouTube, as well as all the different podcast directories. I'm also going to add it to that podcast page on drfinance.info. Um, also check out Paul's website that he mentioned and all his social media. Follow him on there. Follow, uh, like, and subscribe to the podcast, wherever platform you are, as well as uh, definitely check out the newsletter on drfinance.info. Subscribe and confirm your subscription to that so you can get um, updates on awesome interviews like this one today. Also, folks, just real quick for the record, The Necessity of Finance, I wrote that book for my uh, finance students as a college professor over 10 years ago, moved into the next book, The Most Important Lessons in Economics and Finance, and then finally, The Survival of the Richest. Okay, so um, that's all my major works. I also have 13 uh, books that I'm involved with right now on a, on a series called 13 Steps to Riches, which takes the 13 Steps to Riches to a book that Paul talked about earlier, Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill and takes every step and makes a book with it. So there's actually 13 books and many of the celebrities in there are big celebrity names in the self-help space, like Dr. Dennis Waitley, my mentor, Sharon Lector, even the CEO of the Napoleon Hill Foundation, Don Green, uh, has endorsed that book. So definitely check that out as well. And don't forget to check us out on Clubhouse. I'm running big stages every Friday night for over a year now. Paul will be the main guest speaker, as we noted before, July 15, 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern time. I want to see you there, folks, and I'll see you on the next episode. Thank you very much, folks.